Regular meeting number three will now come to order. You please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Thank you, Councilmember. We are uh, pleased to be joined by Pastor Roscoe Roby, Senior Pastor at Community Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Roby, welcome to Council. Let us pray. Most high and gracious God, we come tonight thanking you for the privilege to share in this endeavor tonight. We pray, God, that you bless this council, bless the leader of this council, bless this gathering, that, Father, everything that's done would be done decently and in order. And we pray, Father, that as they continue to do the will of the city of Columbus, that you keep your hand of cover over each one of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favorite, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion dispensed with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Yes, President Harden, members of Council, two items this evening to add. Uh, the first is a notice of appeal to Columbus City Council filed with City Clerk January 15, 2019. The appeal is worded pursuant to section 3359.05E of Columbus City Code, Kemp, Schaefer, and Rao Company, LPA, appeals the Downtown Commission's decision on December 18, 2018 to deny a certificate of appropriateness for an ad mural on the east side of the building located at 88 West Mound Street to Columbus City Council. The appeal is on both issues of law and fact, and the appellant intends to present evidence in the record from the Downtown Commission meeting. It is signed by Scott N. Schaefer, Kemp Schaefer and Rao Company, LPA. The second item is a letter addressed to Kemp Schaefer and Rao Company, LPA, and the Columbus Downtown Commission, signed by all members of City Council today, Monday, January 28th. 2019 stating as follows pursuant to section 3359.05 e of the columbus city code appellant filed a notice of appeal with columbus city council regarding the downtown commission's decision of december 18 2018 denying a certificate of appropriateness for an ad mural on the east side of the building located at 88 west mound street City Council sought the opinion of the Columbus City Attorney as to whether or not the City Attorney believed Council had jurisdiction over this matter based upon the 2016 amendments to City Code 3359.25 addressing content neutral review 
of proposed ad murals on downtown buildings. Based upon the opinion of the city attorney, a copy of which is attached here too, this council finds that it does not have jurisdiction to consider the merits of the disapproval being appealed in this matter as the downtown commission lacked the authority to act once it had approved 88 West Mound Street as an appropriate site for an ad mural. Therefore, the December 18, 2018 decision of the Downtown Commission regarding the proposed ad mural for 88 West Mound Street is vacated and the matter is remanded to the Commission to allow Commission staff to determine whether the application complies with the requirements of City Code 3359.25b and to subsequently process the application appropriately. And that's all at this time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions by members of Council? Councilmember Elizabeth Brown, Councilmember Mitch Brown, Councilmember Remy, Councilmember Favor. Yes, thank you, President Hardin. Tonight I have a resolution number 36X-2019 to honor and recognize the Columbus Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated on behalf of their dedication to mentoring youth and their outstanding service to the community. I would like to call Ms. Deborah Pickens, President of the Columbus Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and Ms. Nina Jackson, Chair of the Delta GEMS Committee, to the podium in order to accept this honor. As they're making their way up, January is known as National Mentoring Month, and the women of Delta Sigma Theta have five enriching programs working with youth in Central Ohio. This resolution reads, whereas Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded on January 13, 1913 by 22 collegiate women at Howard University, the private nonprofit organization's purpose is to provide assistance and support through established programs in local communities throughout the world. And whereas the Columbus, Ohio alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was established on May 20th, 1934. The CAC is a 501C7 organization committed to primarily serving the African American community within Franklin County through the sorority's five point programmatic thrust. And whereas throughout Columbus, the CAC provides numerous educational and enriching programs such as the Shirley Chisholm Conference for Girls in Government, the Dr. Betty Shabazz Delta Academy, Dr. Jeanine L. Noble Delta Gems, and Body and the Alexa Kennedy Doctors and Dentist Conference. And whereas Delta Academy serves as a catalyst for academic excellence among young African American girls between the ages of 11 and 14. The program is designed to address the educational and social development needs of middle school girls focusing on STEM skills. Delta GEMS serves as a catalyst for young African American girls between the ages of 14 and 18 to enhance their abilities to achieve academic excellence. GEMS is an acronym for Growing and Empowering Myself Successfully. The program is designed to develop strong, confident, and respectful young ladies by striving to prepare them to take an active role in their success and in the community. And whereas the members of CAC strive to continue the legacy of sisterhood, scholarship, and service, their annual etiquette brunch held on Saturday, January 26, 2019, features several local mentoring organization, and it teaches young men and women the importance of polite behavior and a positive attitude in society now and therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby congratulate the Columbus Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated on their service and numerous contributions to the City of Columbus. And now I would like to turn it over to President Pickens for any comments. Thank you. To Council President Shannon Harden, thank you again for all of your support and to you Councilwoman Shayla Favors for inviting us to join you today. The Columbus chapter is committed, as uh, Councilwoman Favors stated, to primarily serving the African American community in Franklin County and in the surrounding counties under our five point programmatic thrust. The chapter's various projects and programs are designed to address the needs of a wide range of community residents. 
The chapter provides scholarships to graduating seniors, mentors, preteen and teenage girls through Delta Academy and Delta Gyms, inspires and empowers young men through the Embody program. And we also advocate for and against public policy that impacts our community. We thank the City Council again for this recognition during National Mentoring Month. It is a pleasure to be with you. Look forward to working with you in the city again. I will now introduce Nina Jackson, who's chair of our GEMS committee. Good evening, and thank you again for inviting us out. We're glad to be here. Um, like she said, I'm the co-chair of the Delta GEMS program, and I have been uh, working with this program since 2008. Um, it, the Delta GEM stands for Growing and Empowering Myself Successfully. We service high school girls ages 14 through 18, and this year we had uh, over 100 applications. So we have several um, young ladies that participate in the program. We conduct monthly workshops um, every third Saturday of the month, and our focus this year has been on leadership. Um, every year we try to improve our program, and so this year um, we're hoping that we can um, take them on a college tour. We're still seeking funding for that. But our committee works really hard, to, and we, we use our talents um, to conduct these workshops and to put the workshops together um, with little resources, but um, we have several success stories from um, girls that have completed our program. Um, we have several girls that are now Deltas and that um, have been in the GEMS program. So um, we're extremely happy that we're being recognized today for um, all of our hard work. And so we'd just like to say thank you. Are there any comments from my colleagues? Thank you, Councilwoman Favor. And um, I want to again say congratulations to Delta Sigma Theta. But I also want to say a special thank you to President Pickens and certainly the work that you're doing, Ms. Jackson. Um, I think on, February, on January the 17th, we had the opportunity on the Commission on Black Girls to be able to have a presentation from the uh, from Delta Sigma Theta to share their work with the Delta GEMS and um, I have another program too. They share two programs with our with the commission, and it's programs like this that are critically important for our girls to be able to move forward and to be become strong women. And we are thankful that you gave that presentation. Um, it certainly will show the leadership that comes from an organization like yours to help our girls to move forward. And so again, I thank you for being here tonight. I thank Councilmember Shayla for providing this resolution. But again, most importantly, for the work that you're that is sorely needed for our young girls. And um, so thank you very much. And I'm certainly in favor of this resolution. Thank you, Council. Thank, thank you. Anyone else? All right, I would like to go ahead and move for adoption of the resolution. Second. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Tyson. <clears throat> Thank you, President Harden. I have two resolutions this evening. The first is 0033X-2019, and I am going to ask um, the following people. So, Ms. Jamie Blount and um, all the individuals that are here from Black Girl Mentoring to come to the, up to the podium, please. This resolution is to <clears throat> recognize January as National Mentoring Month in the city of Columbus and to celebrate the leadership of Brown Girls 614 Mentoring Program and their commitment to, my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to mentoring and improving the lives of young ladies in Central Ohio and beyond. 
whereas relationships with caring mentors offer youth, youth valuable support, guiding them toward making positive, healthy life choices. Mentoring programs also offer effective student interventions, improve student attendance and behavior, academic performance, increase high school graduation rates, and in a significant number of instances, culminate into college attendance. Whereas youth mentorship programs help young people improve their self-esteem, enhance their relationships with family members and peers, ultimately helping them to feel a greater sense of connectedness with their community and their schools. Whereas the Brown Girls 614 Mentoring Program, founded by, by Mrs. Jamie Blount and Mrs. Rolanda Beecham, was developed in August of 2016 within the Beatty Recreation Center to empower young brown girls of all shades, to help them recognize their beauty, to understand their worth, to encourage them to thrive for excellence with helping them to embrace their natural beauty by not conforming to societal standards, comparisons to one another, or standards dictated by the mainstream media. The goal of the program is predicated on helping young girls to form lifelong bonds of sisterhood, to build confidence, and to see that every brown girl wins. Whereas the Brown Girl 614 Mentoring Program is a leadership development program for girls 5 to 17, teaching girls cultural awareness, social skill enhancement, educational enrichment, leadership, social change, and community service. In fact, the Brown Girls Mentoring Program is committed to planting seeds for abundant growth, paying it forward by helping young girls to understand that I can be beautiful and reminding them that I am my sister's keeper. The program has more than 50 girls in Columbus 614 chapter and includes a chapter at Hampton University at 757 in Hampton, Virginia, and chapter 813 located in Hampton, in, Hampton, in Tampa, Florida. Whereas the Brown Girls 614 Mentoring Program is consistent with the work of the Commission on Black Girls as it works to ensure that opportunities, successful futures, and the achievement of high quality of life for future generations of women is achieved in Columbus. Whereas January has been designated as National Mentoring Month, a time dedicated to focusing national attention on the need for mentors to ensure brighter futures for young people. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the, by the City of, of Columbus, the Council of City of Columbus, that this Council is hereby recognized January as National Mentoring Month in the City of Columbus and celebrates the leadership of the Brown Girls 614 Mentoring Program and their commitment to mentoring and improving the lives of young ladies in Central Ohio. I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Councilwoman Tyson. I just want to say thank you to City Council for acknowledging us for the work that we're doing um, in the Old Town East area. Our goal is to serve young ladies ages 5 to 17 and to teach them how to become better versions of themselves. And this program is particularly geared for girls of color. We started with 12 girls, and we had this year for 2018, 2019, over 300 applicants but we don't have a lot of manpower. <laughs> so God has been faithful though, because we serve anywhere from on a good day, 25 to 45 girls every session at Beatty Recreation Center from 12 to 2 p.m. every second, third and fourth Saturday. And we equip them with tools that they need through practical life, hygiene, um, self etiquette, self care, self love. That's our goal is to empower them to serve the communities in which they come from where they probably don't see that. So it's our goal just to do the work. And we had no business plan, no structure. We just, me and one of my close friends that was here today, we just came into the recreation center and said that we wanted to do something to help little girls that look like us. Never in imagine in a million years that we would have birthed three chapters. So we just ask that you guys come down to Beatty Recreation Center, come in for a session. We do line dancing, snacks, and our goal is not just to empower 
the girls, but to make that community over there better because our girls don't see a lot of positive influences. So any woman of color, I encourage to stop by, think about donating some time and see the lives that you're changing, not just helping, but you're changing to see that they can see other women who are doing great things. So I just want to say thank you again, and thank you to my lovely team. They make me look really good on paper. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And to our girls who are just, we're, we're doing it. We're out here doing the work, and they're leading by example. So I just want to say thank you again, first and foremost, God. And I want to say thank you, Councilwoman Tyson. Thank you to the city. Thank you. So what we'll do is um, I'm going to have, um, first of all, I want to thank all the, the mentors, the, the leadership team that are here helping and volunteering for this program. And what we always do here is to allow people to say their name. And um, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to, your team can all walk up, say their name, have it working. And we'll even, and, all, and, we, and we especially want the young girls to be able to say their name and be seen on on television because they are all so beautiful and um, for those then tell us what school you may attend and and um, let's let's start thank you hi my name is Janaya my name is Janaya and I go to Berwick elementary K through 8 oh and my mom is Jamie Blunt <laughs> My name is Sanaya, and I go to Wilson Hill, and my mom's name is Basandra McGrea. Hi, my name is Tia Edwards, and I'm one of the mentors with the Brown Girls Program. My name is Brianna McGrea. I go to McCord Middle School. My name is Anaya, and I go to Columbus City Preparatory School for Girls. <clears throat> My name is Ariana, and I go to Columbus Alternative High School. My name is Ramai, and I go to Goldport Madison Middle School South. My name is Joel, and I go to Goldport Madison Middle School Central. <clears throat> My name is Joy, and I go to Goldport Madison Middle School Central. My name is Nia, and I go to Groveport Madison Middle School South. My name is Tiffany Kendrick, and I am a proud partner and mentor with Brown Girls. My name is Kiana Cottrell, and I'm a parent volunteer with um, Brown Girls. My name is April Tisby, and I am a brown girl, and I am very proud of each one of these young ladies, and Miss Blunt. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Brashendra McGurr. I'm a proud parent volunteer. Um, we relocated here to Columbus, and Jamie Blunt and her team, and the whole uh, program has been amazing for my girls. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm DeAsia Blunt, and I'm Jamie Blunt's daughter. Good evening, my name is Ramona Shaw and I'm one of the mentors and volunteers for Brown Girls. Good evening, my name is Camila Guthridge and I am also I'm one of the staff members for Brown Girls and mentor and volunteer as well. Hello, I'm Raven Lynch and I am one of the um, mentors and volunteers for Brown Girls. Hi, my name is Ruby Wagner and I'm part of the leadership staff for Brown Girls. I'm one of the parent volunteers as well. And I am Deborah Thompson. I am serving as a volunteer and in the role of program director. All right. Well, I wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you. Um, they had the opportunity. Jamie presented at the Commission on Black Girls in January also. And this was a meeting where we wanted to hear from 
uh, organizations that are serving our girls, and, um, and they were one of the organizations. It's critically important that we have our girls have these leadership opportunities to be able to see, to first of all, to be around some great role models, and then also to learn from different leaders. And certainly it is, when, when, as we are gathering all the data for the Commission on Black Girls, we've just concluded getting the, we'll have all the data, we, know we now have most of the data from the surveys, et cetera. However, what we have heard consistently is that our girls definitely need to see, see more women of color to be role models for them. And so by this being National Mentoring Month, we would ask that our girls, that if you have the opportunity and want to be able to, to work with girls, especially girls of color, that you would reach out to, you can reach out to Jamie, you can call my office, because there are a lot of organizations doing amazing work that are working with our girls, and we really do not have enough individuals to be out here supporting our girls. So for those of you who are doing this, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're making a, a tremendous difference. Uh, Director Collins, this is an amazing program that's being run out of your, out of the Columbus Recreation and Park System. He's right back there. And um, I, I thank you for allowing this organization to be a part of a Beatty Recreation Center, because as you can see, they're making a difference. And even all the girls may not be from Columbus, you see the importance of of girls will come from different communities because they want to be in groups to be able to learn and be able to be role and see role models that look just like them to move them forward. So again, thank you, Jamie. I have your resolution and I'm so very proud of you that you thought um, that this was so important to get back into a community that you were born and raised in, yes, in the Poindexter, in, in the Poindexter Village community to bring a program back into our community. And I thank you for your leadership. My next resolution, I am going to ask the following individuals to walk towards the podium. It's 0043X-2019, and I'm going to ask Connie Spear, Rochelle Bailey, Alice Luss, and Kate, um, Kate Michela, if I'm saying it right, please come towards the podium. I'm not... Hello, I am Kate Michella. <laughs> On behalf of myself and the American Heart Association, I would like to thank you, Councilwoman Tyson. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. You told me to go. I know. I know. I just realized she looked up at it. This resolution is to declare February the 1st of 2019 as Wear Red Day in the city of Columbus and to raise awareness regarding cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death among women. Whereas cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in women, claiming the lives of one of every three, more than 50% of women are unaware of heart, that heart disease is a leading cause of death for women. Women are of color are even less likely to be aware of this. Moreover, more, nearly 60% of stroke deaths are attributed to women, and about 4 million of the stroke survivors who are alive today are women, and African American women have the highest prevalence of stroke among all women. Whereas 80% of all cardiovascular disease is preventable as the risk factors for heart disease such as high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, they can be controlled. Unfortunately, even with this knowledge, cardiovascular disease kills one woman almost every eight 80 seconds. Whereas the, Af the um, American Heart Association's Go Red for Women movement was designed to motivate women to learn their family history, 
to encourage women to meet with their health care provider, to assess their risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke, to commit to making physical activity and healthy eating a priority, to take charge of their heart health by knowing their total cholesterol, their HDL, the good cholesterol, their bad blood pressure, blood sugar, body mass index, as these steps will help to improve heart health. Whereas the American Heart Association, recognizing the importance of raising awareness through community collaboration, has community programs which include relationships with the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority Blood Pressure Program, the Ward Family YMCA Blood Pressure Program, the Lynx Go Red for Women, Women's Heart Health Education, Celebrate One CPR Program, the African American Male Wellness Walk Initiative, the Blood pressure program and life simple seven program the east london and salem elementary schools teaching garden teaching gardens program and the AK, alpha kappa alpha sororities pink goes red go red for women heart health and initiative and education and most of uh, most uh, and a host of other community partners. Now therefore be it resolved by this council on the city of Columbus. This council is hereby recognize the importance of the ongoing fight against heart disease and stroke and proclaim February 1 of 2019 to be the National Wear Red Day in Columbus, Ohio and I urge all of its citizens to show their support for women and the fight against heart disease by commemorating this day by wearing the color red, by increasing awareness, speaking out about heart disease and empowering women to reduce their risk for cardiovascular disease. We can save a thousand lives each year. Be it further resolved that this council does hereby urges residents to wear red in recognition of family and friends and neighbors who have suffered from the heart disease and to show its support for women and cardiovascular health. And I move for pa adoption. Amend. Amend. Move for amend. Second. I submit to the clerk. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Amend it. No. Now I can Thank go. And <laughs> move for adoption. <laughs> So my apologies for... Please call the roll. Brown, Thank Brown, you. favor, Remy Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you. Now I can go. Okay, okay, now I'm going to go. Yes. Uh, on behalf of myself and the American Heart Association, thank you, Councilwoman uh, Tyson and Council President Harden and the members of the council. I am thrilled to see the council calling attention to the number one killers of women, stroke, and heart disease by supporting the Go Red for Women this year. I joined a group, a statistic, that I never thought I would be part of on Wednesday, February 10, 2016, almost three years ago. I became a stroke survivor um, at the ripe old age of 31. Although I try not to let this define who I am, um, this experience has shaped the person I have become. My redirected future goal is to now inspire, educate, advocate, and beat, the down, beat down the current stereotypes of who will be impacted. Although 80% of strokes can be prevented, mine was almost inevitable. I was diagnosed with a left internal carotid artery dissection, which may have been caused by the perfect storm of untreated hypertension from birth control, high intensity fitness, and stress from night school. Uh, the last three years has taught me so much about myself and my support team. Although my recovery is, will be indefinite, I know I'm on the right path with my team and my specialists and my family by my side. I hope by looking at me, uh, you can change the perception of who can be affected and know that I am not a victim, but a survivor and I will proudly wear red this Friday. I offer my most heartfelt appreciation uh, to you, Councilwoman Tyson, and the entire council for your support in creating a visual display throughout Columbus to help the American Heart Association further their efforts in stopping the number one killer of women, your support is truly invaluable. And I apologize for jumping the gun earlier. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Hello, I'm Alice Luce. I'm the Community Health Director for the American Heart Association. And on behalf of my, um, so I would also like to echo Kate's comments to thank Councilwoman Tyson, Council President Hardin, and all the members of the council. Cardiovascular disease causes one in three deaths among women each year, more than all cancers combined. Fortunately, we can change that because 80% of these events could be prevented through lifestyle changes. 
Go Red for Women fights to increase awareness, speak out about heart disease, and empower women like Kate to reduce their risks of cardiovascular disease. With your support of proclaiming Wear Red Day in Columbus, we can raise awareness and rally support of all women to take action, change the odds, one heart at a time. I invite everyone to attend the Go Red for Women luncheon Thursday, February 21st at the Greater Columbus Convention Center, and my heartfelt thanks to the council. Thank you so much, Alice and Kate, and our count. Everyone has on red here. Yes, and you all are in support. We're so happy and, about that. And um, we'll make sure we have it on February first. And we thank you for the work that you're doing in our community to change the lives of families. Because if someone does have a stroke or a heart attack, it affects the entire family. So thank you for your ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Uh, before we move any further, we have um, uh, Ms. Kay from and Scott Holbert and Kay Barnes from the Mid East Community Collaborative here to make a presentation. Do you have one more? Okay. Uh, so, uh, would you come forward, please? Ms. Kay, welcome back to council. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> as a way of introduction to those who know me and then those who are being introduced to me, my name is Quay Barnes, and I'm the president of the Miz East Area Community Collaborative. And I passed out a folder to you, uh, kind of as an introduction to you, Ms. Favor. Um, on the left side is a map which shows that the Mid East Area Community Collaborative from east to west is bounded by Bexley and Whitehall, to the north by Veterans Hospital, to the south by a little, uh, little south of I-70. We cover 46,000 residents and over 23,000 households. Uh, behind that, I just gave you a little list of our accomplishments uh, from 2006 to the present. And uh, we're here tonight uh, on the issue of code enforcement, asking you possibly for a staff increase <laughs> for code enforcement. As many of you know, the MAC does not come down here just to complain. Usually when we come down, we've already fight, tried to fight the, the situation ourselves, and we usually offer you uh, some sort of suggestion. So on the right side of your folder, you'll see a dispatch article from 2016, which we brought awareness to what I call piddly uh, cold problems, such as high grass, uh, garbage bags left in the street, and um, people who park in their front grass. Uh, in 2017, the MAC approached code enforcement and our police liaison office to change the policy to cut the amount of time that it takes to deal with these concerns, and in fact, mostly for repeat offenders. All right. The city of Columbus listened to us and changed the policy due to our suggestion, first giving residents a warning, and upon request, uh, and upon repeat, then we wrote up, they would write a report. If the issue were to continue, then fines were supposed to be administered. Uh, that was, we were very proud to know that that was accepted citywide, so it is now a citywide pro uh, policy. However, <laughs> the policy takes a long time. The process still isn't working. As you can see from the photos enclosed in the, on the right side, our residents, in, again, in 2018, uh, asked for code enforcement to come out, 311, keep Columbus beautiful in the city attorney's office. And we asked them to please, please, please work on the policy. Uh, when we ask our residents to come out, you can see that we always have a great amount that do come out. And so I'm standing here representing them tonight. Please consider increasing the code department staffing. Uh, they can only do so much. We've talked to the new administrator. She's only been on the job 30 days. So she's doing the best she can. But we need to know 
we need to know that if there are any surplus funds, additional officers are needed. And see, it's all about perception. It's perception of people who come into our neighborhoods and they look and they see this and they think that's the way we want to live. And it's also a perception that our neighbors have of themselves. Of, is this the way I have to live? So please help us with that. And to emphasize how it affects just one neighborhood, I'm going to ask uh, Scott Herbert from Leewood Gardens, part of our uh, MAC, to come up and tell you how it affects just one neighborhood. Council Member Hardin, Council Members, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Scott Hurlbert from Leewood Gardens neighborhood. And many of my fellow civic leaders, including myself, have lived within the MAC area for more than three decades. We have witnessed and are still witnessing the degradation of our neighborhood since the Great Recession hit in 2008. As you know, one essential way to reclaim our neighborhoods is through the Division of Code Enforcement, addressing basic tenets of community norms, as Quay spoke about. And while we are most grateful for Area 7 Code Enforcement, Supervisor Maria Babb and her team are fantastic. They're great people. We continue to ask for more efficiency and expedience in expediency in these efforts though. The vast majority of code violations originate from rental properties and by default from the landlords thereof. Landlords who can well afford to con correct the infractions. In the last 10 years there were 4,069 311 calls that emanated just from rental properties just from our relatively small neighborhood. Four thousand sixty-nine. That is more than 400 311 calls per year, more than one per day, to say nothing of the number of 311 calls from the entirety of Area 7. From two recent conversations we've had, well, to, first let me say this, to put it simply, code enforcement needs more personnel. And that may very well mean that more funding as part of the 2019 city budget needs to be directed their way. From two recent conversations we've had, Supervisor Daniel Weber offered the code, offered the code enforcement does not have enough personnel to handle the ever increasing, increasing caseload. And newly appointed code administrator, Heather Truesdale, and we welcome her with open arms recently phrased it in another more diplomatic way. She said she would never turn down more personnel. From dozens of examples of how simply things move, how slowly things move at times, here is just one. A vehicle parked on the front lawn of a nearby rental property, something that does not cost anyone anything to simply stop doing. It has taken 48 days, my little props here, 48 days and counting for a reported 311 request to be even assigned to an Area 7 code officer. That is not uncommon. That's 48 days before it's even inspected, before even a citation is written, before any of that. 48 days for that practice of parking in the front yard to establish its ugly self as the norm in our community. <clears throat> you already know the Max reputation for working hard to meet the city of Columbus more than halfway. So now we ask, give us the support we need to restore vitality and stability to our neighborhoods. The investment will more than pay for itself in reduced crime, higher property values, and stronger neighborhoods. And to finish this up, I'd like to share something with you. We in the MAC and the Greater East Side want to be seen. 
We want to be seen by viable businesses looking for new locations. We want to be seen by families who want to live and raise their children in a safe, attractive, and friendly neighborhood. We want to be seen and talked about in a positive way. And we want to feel proud of our neighborhoods again. We really miss that feeling. Help us get there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, first of all, um, the MAC is a, a long, um, strong relationship of, of advocacy and working closely with um, both the administration and certainly this council. And so we um, greatly appreciate your advocacy uh, and, and hear you. I'd be interested to know the, 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 the work that was done before coming tonight. I saw that some, uh, some conversations uh, had been had with uh, depart with the department, and maybe this question is, is for uh, Director um, Shoney, but want to see the follow-up and, and how um, we can kind of kind of move forward. Director. Uh, thank you, Council President Harden, members of Council. Uh, first, let me um, thank uh, our speakers for their continued partnership. Um, I do find that when I'm on the east side, um, I find myself uh, listening to them and saying, well, why not? A lot. And so um, when Ms. Barnes pointed to how we change repeat offenders, it was one of those meetings where they brought some ideas to us and we said, well, why not? And uh, tried to move forward. So um, uh, yes, Heather Tuesdale met with them, I think Thursday or Friday last week? Friday. 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 Um, so she and I just talked about their conversation today. We're looking into it. Uh, we're looking into the data to try and figure out if there are other ways we can be more efficient with the resources. Um, that we have, and uh, I forget how Heather had um, responded to their their desire for us to have more code code officers. But I think she said it perfectly. I can't remember what the right what the exact words were, but I'll leave it at that. So um, we think we perform well. Um, we can, you know, resources more resources are always great, uh, but we think we perform well. We think. Um, that we use our funds efficiently, and we're always looking for ways to be more efficient. Specifically to the 48 days, is that normal? No, it's not. And actually, I want to follow up and find out um, what the story is behind that, and if there's a problem where we are seeing that kind of responsiveness consistently, or lack thereof. Um, I want to kind of get to the bottom of that. OK. Council members, I would say that um, Stanley Gates, I think from, from Council Outreach Team, will be point for any follow-up working with the department and working with uh, the MAC just to make sure that we are kept in the loop as we have these conversations uh, to see uh, uh, where we get to. Thank you. Um, before we get to the consent agenda, I want to go back to Councilmember Tyson. I think she had one more presentation uh, to bring before Council. Thank you, President Howard. I'm going to ask Michael Corey, who is the Executive Director of the Franklin County, the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County, to come to the podium, please. Um, I asked Michael to come because, um, as you know, we had a, sh a shutdown that lasted about 35 days, and um, and now, of course, we're out of the shutdown. We'll talk about the effects of what has happened in our community, and that there certainly are you know, comments about there being uh, a shutdown could occur in 21 days by February the 15th. So uh, I, would love for, I would like for Michael to really to share the impact it's had on our community in terms of the human service organizations. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Good evening, Council Members, and a special welcome to Councilmember Favor. Congratulations on your role. We're looking forward to working with you. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Corey, uh, and I'm the Executive Director of the Human Service Chamber, uh, which is a chamber of commerce for nearly 70 nonprofits, uh, direct service nonprofits in our community. It is my unfortunate duty to offer a few brief remarks about the ongoing effects of the now concluded federal government shutdown on our sector. Um, I should underscore at the outset um, in our sector, the negative effects of the shutdown have been significant in breadth and in depth. These effects are intertwined and challenging for each and all of our agencies. From disrupted funding streams to unanswered phone calls to the delay of tax refunds, the disabling of our federal government hurt not only 800,000 furloughed federal workers, 
but millions of people across the country for a historic 35 days. While some of the human service agencies we represent have been affected more directly than others, each of our agencies has been working to deal with the ramifications. Fortunately, some of the feared issues will now be moot, but many of the challenges have already been dealt and have dealt unnecessary strain since the shutdown began in December. And though it is surely welcome news that the government will at least be open temporarily, the harmful effects of this shutdown will persist through at least the beginning of March for our agencies and our community. The most widespread consequence of the shutdown is the effect it has had on SNAP, or food stamps. In Franklin County alone, 144,000 people are approved for SNAP benefits. Because of the shutdown, SNAP benefits for February were distributed early, last week in fact. Even with the government up and running again, no additional SNAP benefits will be distributed until at least March. The concern many of our agencies have is that people will exhaust their benefits well before new SNAP benefits are distributed. Our agencies are bracing for the consequences accordingly. I've spoken with some of you about what our community might do to meet this challenge. While I have no clear answers, I would urge this body to help us educate the public that all SNAP recipients should stretch their benefits into March. There is unfortunately much misinformation out there about these benefits. For example, there are false rumors that the benefits will expire February 1st. This is making us even more nervous about what crisis may come in the next few weeks. Beyond SNAP, the reopening of the federal government will not immediately alleviate the effects of the shutdown. Because of the shutdown's unprecedented duration, there is also an unprecedented backlog of work at numerous federal agencies, the ripple effect of which is impossible to quantify or predict. For example, the IRS was back at work today, but with five million unopened pieces of mail to sift through. Consider the importance that so many of our agency's clients place upon tax refunds as just one example. Delays will have unfortunate ripple effects. Amplify that across all the affected agencies and all the people and nonprofit organizations reliant upon those agencies and their ability to operate, and you get a sense of the challenge that may lie ahead. There were, of course, many other governmental programs that were harmed by the shutdown, programs upon which our agencies and our community relies, from the Victims of Crime Act, Act to WIC to Medicare to the Violence Against Women Act, the severity of the shutdown on Franklin County would have been even more significant. At the Human Service Chamber, as with so many of our agencies, we have been working diligently to educate our congressional delegation in particular about the effects of this shutdown. Our work reached its peak this past Thursday morning when we convened 50 of our nonprofit CEOs with 10 different public officials in their offices, including Councilmember Tyson and the legislative aide for Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. The conversation was wide ranging and hopefully informative, including and especially for the four congressional offices that were in attendance. While I wish we could take some credit for the deal that was finally reached Friday night, we will continue collecting information from our agencies and sharing what we learn with all of our elected officials about the ramifications of this shutdown. The situation is unfortunately fluid, but we are grateful to all the local efforts to reopen our government and to minimize the consequences on our agencies and on the people we serve in Franklin County. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for coming down. I don't know if anyone has any questions for Michael, but certainly, as you just mentioned, um, when an individual gets, we didn't mention, but when an individual gets a paycheck that has zero on it and they need to go and buy prescription medicine, go buy, even if, whether they, they're not on SNAP to try to buy food, you don't have the resources, they come to social service agencies. And so I do want to thank you for your leadership and hosting the meeting. I want to thank the nonprofit leaders who have vowed to work together to try to help each organization to continue to help the residents of our community. And so um, certainly we hope that there will be an agreement and on February the 15th, and our, our, our country will continue to move forward. 
Um, but certainly, we don't even want to say this, but if, there, if it does not happen, we certainly want you to keep us apprised of uh, any issues and concerns so that we can make sure that we're working with our other elected colleagues to be able to help our community. So thank you. Thank you for coming down and sharing. That's all I have. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and also, I just want to shout out for appreciation the Public Utilities Department who scrambled uh, last week to uh, uh, provide uh, waivers for furloughed federal employees if they weren't able to make their utilities payments. So we appreciate you, Director, uh, and Council for helping uh, get that, that through. Uh, are there any other comments, City Attorney, City Treasurer, uh, City Auditor? Madam Auditor. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Um, as you guys uh, know, of course, on Council, we're spending a great deal of time embarking on a lot of community engagement as well as modernization in the city's division of income tax. It has a touch point to every single citizen, every single worker here in the city, as well as our corporate citizens as well. Um, I'm going to have Beth maybe come forward. I'm not going to make you speak, but Beth is uh, the chief administrative officer in the division of income tax. And I'd just like um, to be able to introduce her a little bit to uh, council members tonight. So over the next couple of days, we're going to be embarking on a, a really special schedule. Um, number one, we're doing a great partnership with the United Way. And as you might be familiar with the tax time program and helping our, our citizens and our, our workers here in Columbus um, fulfill their tax requirements, file forms, fill out forms uh, at the federal, state, and local levels for free. Um, in addition to that, so we're going to begin that on Saturday, and the tax time schedule, which is a partnership with United Way, AARP, and I believe the Food Bank, is available online on Facebook and so forth. Um, separately tonight, I'm really proud of this, thanks to Beth's efforts and the Division uh, or Department of Neighborhoods here at the city, we're going to be releasing our income tax forms for an individual's in um, the instructions in five different languages, which is something we've never done before. And, um, you know, if there's a way for us to eliminate the barriers to paying taxes, and especially the complexity, that's really a, a, an effort we're, we're seeking over the next few months. And so effective tonight, um, the forms will be in, uh, the instruction forms will be in Spanish, Somali, French, Nepali, and Arabic. Um, also in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing some interpretation services, so a formal schedule so that if an individual, we, we take a lot of pride on our customer service, wishes to come into the office for a one-on-one -on -one meeting and actually help um, have, have some help working through their tax forms, those interpretive services, again, thanks to the good help of neighborhoods, will be provided. And what, what we'll do is, since um, you all are, are so connected to your respective constituents, we'll try and get that to you so you can share it accordingly. And thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Auditor, for your Any leadership. questions? That's why I brought Beth up. She can better answer any questions. I can better try to answer <laughs> any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. May we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk? Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Harden. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda? Finance Committee Ordinances 184, 185, 186, 205, 207, 215, 251, 252, and 255-2019. 255 Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinance 147-2019. Public Utilities Committee Ordinance 3427-2018. And Ordinances 4899, 125, 128, 133, 134, 139. 152, 166, 169, 171, 176, 182, 183, 188, 191, 228, and 248 2019. Rules and Reference Committee, Ordinances 352 and 362, and 127 2019. Zoning Committee, Ordinances 257, 258, and 275 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, would you now uh, read the following ordinance that appear on agenda as consent action? Resolutions of Expression 38, X39, 40, 41, 26, 34, 42, 44, 28, 30, 31, 
and 32X-2019. Finance Committee Ordinances 3159, 3495, 3508-2018, Resolution 2X-2019, Ordinances 34, 200, 211, 236, 254, 287-2019. Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 3459-2018, 3460 2018 ordinances 123 195 and 217 2019 public safety committee ordinances 3115 2018 and 213 2019 public service and transportation committee ordinances 3449 and 3490 2018 resolutions 3x 4x 6 12 13x-2019 and ordinances 32 and 164 2019 administration committee ordinances 15 21 22 23 24 60 and 175 2019 economic development and small business committee ordinances 63 177 178 and 218 2019 housing committee ordinances 56 67 69 281 2019 judiciary and court administration committee ordinance 266 2019 technology committee ordinances 130 and 250 2019 public utilities committee ordinances 3067 3072 3182 3311 3389 3428 3453 2018 and ordinances 528 29 31 and 33 2019 Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have three speakers on the consent action portion of the agenda. Um, I'm going to uh, first call up Norman Werner, speaking on in favor of Ordinance 0069 2019. Mr. Werner, welcome back to welcome to council. Just a reminder, you have three minutes to speak on this ordinance. If you give your name, your address, and any organization that you may represent. Thank you, Council President. My name is Norman Wernett. I'm president of the Ohio Alliance for Retired Americans. I'm here uh, to speak on behalf of Ordinance 69-29 uh, 2019 to authorize the appropriation of the general permanent improvement and its stated uh, purpose to provide assistance in improving housing uh, affordability in Columbus. Um, the Ohio Alliance advocates for retirement security. We are retired workers who organized our workplaces for continuous improvement in working conditions, hours, wages, and benefits. We built the economy and, its exp and the expansion that this community exp experiences. Unfortunately, not all of us have been able to secure decent, safe, and sanitary housing that is affordable. Many of us uh, experience the losses of pensions and retirement savings because of the Great Recession and the myriad of economic upheavals during our work lives, and either pay ever-increasing rents uh, or live in homes we own without the financial means to maintain them. We are often placed in position of voting for tax increases to fund the, the uh, education of our grandchildren, pay for the maintenance, medication, and medical bills, or fix up our property. Decreased funding in supportive services at the state and federal levels is a barrier as well. Columbus has uh, followed public policies uh, that lead to economic segregation and the issues of affordable and unaffordable housing in past years. We are glad to see that the city begin, is beginning to change those policies. We, now, uh, from well we know from well-documented research that it is economically more sustainable for older residents to remain in the community as long as possible rather than become warehoused at the expense of the state. We are glad to know that Mayor Ginther is taking initial steps uh, with the ballot initiative. Uh, research shows that more funding is needed to address our housing crisis, especially for seniors. Increased funding uh, from the general fund budget seems to be a more, sus more sustainable. I support the bread organization's two requests to the city. One, to encourage developers to set aside new housing units uh, for families that make less than $42,000 a year. And two, to give additional 
uh, an additional $5 million per year uh, to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, what would it take uh, for the city to grant these requests? I can provide you with uh, my testimony and uh, some resources uh, in addition to that. Uh, a speaker following me from the Bread Organization will tell her own personal story on the effects of us as seniors. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions or comments uh, by my colleagues? Ms. Warren, thank you uh, for your advocacy and support for Ordinance 69. Is there? I can this. And the next person coming for council is Ms. Barbara Tober, who's also speaking in support of 0069-2019. Tober, welcome to council. Just a reminder if you state your name, your address, and if you represent any organization. Yes. Good evening, Good evening. to uh, President Harding and council members. I am a 76-year-old retired unmarried female. My name is Barbara Tober and live at 1006 East 19th Avenue. I had applied and was accepted into the Rehabilitation Department of Development Housing Division program. I own my home, but I am struggling to keep up the maintenance. The bids had been sent out to five contractors selected from the city's co uh, contractors participation rotating list. Three contractors came out to the house and placed their bids. Then 13 days before the bids were scheduled to be open, I received a Dear John letter stating that the city regrets to inform me that there are no additional funds remaining to allow the city to continue processing my request for service. And of course, they included a list of resources that I could apply for po possible help. Some of these sources are not accepting applications, nor do they, they do not do certain repairs. This left me with the task of trying to find another avenue. We are talking about some of the repairs, not the whole list that so far I have been quoted. Somewhere between eight to $10,000, which is out of the question for me. I told someone if I could keep the overall cost at no more than 2,000 and work out a workable payment plan, I could do it. I'm looking at the front wall structural problems with air and mice, and yes, I said mice, coming in, and the basement. And maybe next year, we can look at the roof repairs, which means at 77 years of age, I'm going to have to continue to work part-time as a sub-secretary with CCS. All things are possible through God, who was my husband man. There, there needs to be a real program for senior citizens that will help keep them in their homes and keep them in good repair. Bread pushed very hard to win the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. The fund has led to more affordable housing for low-income families. As we look at strategies that the city is considering for addressing housing issues, we're concerned. Thank you, Ms. Tober. I'm going to turn it over to President Pro Tem Cinziano. I know last, well, for several months he's been working specifically on this issue and, and been showing really good leadership um, uh, in terms of, of housing, and, and especially with seniors. So, President Pro Tem. Well, thank you, Council President, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Warnett and Ms. Tolber. Uh, we did have a great forum last week regarding uh, housing stabilization with a focus on our age-friendly uh, 65 and over residents. Sat down with Director Shoney. Uh, and really have appreciated Council President and the staff's ongoing uh, focus on this issue. Uh, we are working collaboratively on solutions to address exact situations that you raised uh, and welcome the opportunity to follow up uh, at the meeting or anytime um, when we get a break uh, about how we can connect and, and work towards solutions together. Thank you, Council President Harden. Thank you, President Pro Tem. I'd also uh, make two other points. One, that um, Council Member Favors would be chairing housing, so as President Pro Tem, um, transitions off and, and some of the leadership. I know that there were some very specific um, 
uh, recommendations that came out of the, the uh, sessions that you led. And I uh, look forward to working with Councilmember Favors and this council in uh, following up on those. And also I wanted to recognize Councilmember Tyson, because I don't know that the specific, specific area, but in terms of the, the roofing program that Councilmember Tyson funds uh, each year, we want to make sure that that information is getting out to the appropriate folks um, so that we can spend those dollars down. Uh, and so, um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tomer. Oh, uh, Council Member Tyson. Thank you, President Harden, and certainly I want to thank Council Member President Pro Tim Stenziano on his work for Age Friendly. And I had a discussion even today that you know someone said to me, "Well, it seems like we don't care about seniors," and that isn't true. We have Age Friendly. We do care about seniors. But at, but to respond to this issue, we certainly have to make sure that in our neighborhoods, that as we continue to to um, enhance our neighborhoods, we want to make sure that people are currently or living in those neighborhoods have an opportunity to um, to continue to as we're looking at adding new housing to communities how do we make sure we're keeping people who are in those residents there and there are certainly a number of programs that are in the Department of Development that are focused on those particular areas and we need to think about how we look at our our um, our capital funding to be able to add you know those dollars to be able to support the kinds of infrastructure programs that um, that she was just speaking about we really do have to think about where are there opportunities to provide uh, get the fund to put more dollars in and also once we have the dollars to get those repairs and the dollars out it's unfortunate that someone had people come out look at her property and I mean it gets your hopes up that you're going to be able to get something and then get a you know a letter that says we don't have any more funds so we really need to think about how we the administration of that particular situation because we don't want that to be people's perception of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. And I would just say thank you to Brad for your advocacy on this issue. We look forward to the partnership and working uh, as we uh, stack hands to address affordable housing crisis that we have in our city. So thank you. We have one, um, our final speaker on the uh, cons consent agenda is John uh, Hennick. Mr. Hennick, welcome to Council. Uh, speaking against Ordinance 0063-2019. Welcome to Council. Would you state your name, your address, and any organization if you represent one, please. Good evening. My name is John Honick, uh, 2992 Shady Knoll Lane. Uh, I'm just here representing myself. Uh, good evening, Council President Hardin, uh, President Pro Tem Stenziano, and esteemed members of Columbus City Council. Uh, my name is John Honick. I'm a resident of the west side of Columbus within the Hilliard City School District. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I'm here to express my opposition to Consent Action 46, Ordinance 0063-2019, proposing to accept the application uh, for the annexation of certain territory in Norwich and Brown Townships. The Sugar Farms development, as it's known, will bring over 1,100 dwelling units mm. to the Hilliard area and will have a profound impact on the quality of life of far west side residents. I'm requesting that the council delay action on this ordinance until more community input is obtained and certain fundamental issues are addressed. Number one, uh, the council should sponsor and, re and review a thorough traffic study before voting on this measure. The average U.S. household has two cars, so a development of this size will add several thousand cars each day to narrow two-lane roads uh, that are already inadequate to handle existing traffic loads. Sh city planners should be able to identify for the public uh, which roads will be widened and whether the city will need to make use of eminent domain. Number two, the amount of green space within the, the development should be examined more closely and with more clarity from the developer about counting retention ponds towards the Darby Accords green space requirements. The vote of the Big Darby Accord Advisory Panel to approve the plan was four to three, indicating that some members have substantial reservations about the plan. Number three, the Hilliard City School District should be a full partner from the outset at, of the beginning of the development. Ideally, a neighborhood of this size should include an elementary school centrally located in the neighborhood, a concept that has been successfully implemented in other Hilliard locations. This will allow young children to walk to school and will cut down on the amount of traffic in the area. Also, it will allow the school to be a true focal point for community activities. 
Lastly, this development and a proposed development on the west side of Alton Darby Creek Road uh, within the city of Hilliard appear to be the latest steps in bringing high density development to the Big Darby Creek watershed. As development marches westward, it will become impossible to maintain the ecological balance of the creek and its watershed. City Council, along with other local governments, should make more use of Clean Ohio funds and other resources to purchase agricultural easements and other, find other means uh, to put ecologically sensitive areas outside the reach of development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hannock. Uh, I'm going to be standing there, but I'm going to ask uh, Director Shoney to speak to this ordinance, um, and then I'll, if you, there are any questions for the speaker. Uh, thank you, President Hart, members of council. This is an annexation ordinance, annexation acceptance ordinance. Uh, the, the annexation has already been approved by uh, Franklin County. We are by state law under a um, under a timeline on which council must act on the annexation acceptance. So there is a, a need, I know the speaker requested a delay, there is a need to act on this legislation one way or the other. In terms of next steps, this is simply an annexation. This is not an approval of um, zoning. This is not an approval of um, any variances. There will still be further action required by city council. This is a project that we are paying close attention to. Um, it has been, um, I think, more than a decade since the Darby Accords were uh, brought in to, um, were enacted and approved by City Council. We are looking, this is the first major development we've had since those um, came into effect. And so we are being very careful in how we look at this. Our staff um, has been coordinating with Director Gallagher's staff to look at the traffic impacts. That's something we're taking into account. So this is um, the first piece of action. Um, it is not uh, by any stretch of the imagination a um, final approval from the city's perspective, but it is something that we need council to take action on today. Thank you, Director. And this area is not covered by Area Commission, correct? At the at the moment, I think that this is the area that they're you're working to get set up. I believe that's correct. All right. Well, we look forward to to working with you guys as we go through these processes. As the director was explaining, um, this is. Uh, a little bit more than procedural, but there's a lot of steps in between um, uh, coming back to us and, and a final approval. And I um, look forward to, to working with uh, Councilmember Tyson, Chair of, of uh, uh, Zoning, and, and others as we have those, those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming down to Council. Are there any other questions or comments on the consent action and first reading portions of the agenda? Seeing none, I move for passage by voice. Please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Favor? Yes. Remy? Yes. Stenziano? Yes, with the exception of 2X-2019, on which I am abstaining. Tyson? Yes. President Hardin? Yes, with the exception of 3159-2018, uh, with, the, with the exception uh, I am abstaining. Passed. We will now move to the second reading. Uh, Time is it? Yeah, second reading. We'll, our first uh, committee to come before council is the Finance Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Um, tonight in Finance, we uh, have five resolutions that will establish the necessity of placing the city's voted bond package proposal on the ballot for the May 7th election. The package is broken down into five areas health, safety, and infrastructure recreation and parks, public service, which includes roads and sidewalk investments, water power and sewer, and for the first time, $50 million for neighborhood development that will focus primarily on affordable housing. These voted bond funds are used by the city to make important investments in all of our neighborhoods that have had uh, a tremendous impact on the quality of life in Columbus. I want to start um, by turning the floor to Auditor Kilgore. Can you please explain more about how voted bond funds work and their advantages over the traditional bond sale that a city might use to fund its annual capital budget? Certainly. Finance Chair Brown, thank you. Uh, members of Council, general obligation bonds are municipal bonds, which provide a way for the city to finance its large-scale capital projects. Um, these general obligation bonds are the most commonly used financing instruments in the country, and largely these are the bonds that, that build America. 
Um, they're called general obligation bonds because they're not backed by a specific revenue producing project or source. Instead, they're backed by the city's full faith and credit. In simple terms, that means the bonds are backed by the city's ability to tax and to raise taxes is, if necessary in order to pay bondholders. However, uh, like maybe the new school building uh, levies that you've seen and you've personally experienced, the City of Columbus does not raise property taxes to finance our bonds or repay our bonds. Here at the city, we pledge to repay these bonds using a combination of user rates in the instance of projects like your, your water reservoirs, your sewer lines, um, or from the income tax quarter percent set aside, which is how we pay for the bonds um, that we've used or issued to fund recreation and parks facilities, maybe streets um, and typical projects like that. The city has a really long history of seeking its voter support via our bond packages. Uh, since 1956, we've asked our citizens to support these traditional capital pro improvements, and overwhelmingly, we've received uh, the support of our voters and our citizens. 90 out of 96 voted bond issues have passed since 1956. That's tremendous. 90 out of 96. Um, the last one to fail was in 1981, and that was for a, a project that was a bit untraditional. Um, so why do we seek this voter approval? Uh, first of all, Voted bonds, or unlimited bonds as they're called, carry traditionally the lowest cost of borrowing. So in other words, we can do more projects for less money um, onto our, our citizens and our ratepayers for sewer and water. Today, approximately 83% of our entire, entire debt portfolio is voted. Um, that's a very spectacular statistic, 83%. That means we're able to sell the city's bonds to investors, not only at our, our AAA bond rating, uh, which I, as you know is, is the highest rating a, a government can get, but also with voter approval, which will result in a uh, absolute lo lower, uh, lower cost of borrowing because of that added layer of security. With 83% of our debt portfolio carrying this voted support, the financial benefits to our citizens are significant. Depending upon market times, um, the timing of the market, uh, what the bond markets are like whenever we actually take these various bonds to market, this could result in potentially millions of dollars of savings over the course of these issues. And that's why the, the voted bond package is so important to the city in obtaining our, our, our voter support. Um, as you know, we've embarked on a variety of, of community meetings over the last couple of weeks, and there's a, a good bit to come as well. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor Kilgore. And um, the backing of voters is important, but we haven't had to actually go back to the voters and, and raise their taxes, um, even though we are um, borrowing with the full faith. That, that's credit. very important. Uh, we have not um, financed Chair Brown, and we have no intention of doing so. The city, as I mentioned, has a lot of variety of self-imposed limitations. Our one and a half times coverage of revenues over expenditures the way that we take a quarter of income tax and set it aside. So as a result of that, those capital plans and our fiscal policies, we um, commit to the voters that we will not raise property taxes in order to repay these bonds. Thank you, and that's due to sound fiscal management, so I appreciate your, your leadership and uh, collaboration with council. Uh, the mayor's office also hosted uh, four community meetings over the last two weeks since the package was first introduced to share their proposal with residents and answer questions. You had good turnout at these, um, these meetings. Director Lombardi, could you just briefly share with council some of the feedback that you heard? Sure. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, Council Member Brown, other council members. Uh, like it was indicated, we had four, uh, the administration put on four community meetings um, to discuss the voted bond package. They were held at the Linden Recreation Center, Glenwood Recreation Center, Driving Park Recreation Center, and uh, Marion Franklin um, Recreation Center. Before I go too far, I want to thank uh, Director Collins for letting us use his rec centers for these meetings. I know it's a lot of work to get those prepared for us. But uh, at those meetings, we spoke, um, as the auditor said, we spoke about what a bond package is and what it isn't and how they work. Um, and then we broke uh, our departments into different uh, tables, and the community was able to go to any of those departments and ask specific questions about what they had planned to do with their portion of the voted bond package. We also provided uh, a, a packet that showed not only what's in this packet, 
over this package, but uh, what we've done in the past, some of the neighborhoods that we are considering doing some work in, and it allowed uh, our, citizens, our residents to um, talk to our departments and get feedback. We also had uh, comment cards at each table where we wanted to hear from the community. We wanted to hear what they uh, would like to see uh, us do with uh, over a billion dollars over the next five years. And so those uh, cards were then uh, given to the uh, mayor's office and uh, we'll be going through those as we move down the road. But I would say that the feedback was very positive from uh, the folks that had attended. Uh, Driving Park, which I attended, I just have to mention, it was uh, last Wednesday, and if you recall, it was a monsoon out there, and, and I thought, how many people will be here? And we had nearly 30 people uh, at that meeting, and it was very engaged, and I'm really happy to say that our, our community is very engaged in what the city is trying to do. So um, with that, if anyone has any other additional questions, I can answer them for you. Thank you so much, Director Lombardi. Are there any questions for my colleagues before I proceed with the resolutions? Uh, and thank you for the, the work on the meetings. Chair, do you think we should pause and go to zoning, or you want to? Uh, whatever, whatever you think, Council President. Let's go ahead and, and, and mo get a motion to adjourn. Okay. I'm sorry. Just because we're, we're getting close to 6.30 or just past 6.30, you want to uh, stick with the, the charter and go to our zoning. Um, but before I take a motion to adjourn, uh, I want to recognize, I saw Pastor Troy uh, come into council chambers. I want to recognize Pastor Troy. Thank you for being here in historic New Salem. Thank you to a motion to adjourn. A recess, I, I apologize. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Recess. This meeting is recessed. We will take zoning shortly. Regular meeting number four will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. We will now go to the zoning committee. Council Member Tyson chairs that committee. All members serve on the committee. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side. And we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you. The first zoning is 0180. 01080-2019 to rezone 4240 Truel Station Road, being 8.9 acres located at the northwest intersection of Truel, Truel Station Road and South Hamilton Road, from C4 Commercial District to M Manufacturing District. The applicant is 0000 Truel Station LLC the um, in care of attorney Jeffrey L. Brown. The proposed use is concrete, asphalt, and dirt recycling. The C department's recommendation is approval, and the Midwest Community Collaborative recommendation is approval. I first move to waive second reading. Second. Thank you. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0181-2019 to rezone 4147 True Road Station Road, being 7.12 acres located west of the terminus of True Road Station Road, just south of Interstate 70 from M1 Manufacturing District to M Manufacturing District. The applicant is 0000 Truel Station LLC, care of Jeffrey L. Brown, attorney. The proposed use is concrete and asphalt recycling. The city department's recommendation is approval. The Mid East Area Community Collaborative recommendation is approval. I first move to waive second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson. Waive. 
President Hardin. Thank you. Can I move for passage? <laughs> Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next one is 0198 yes, 2019 to rezone 2827 Bethel Road, being 1.01 acres located at the southeast corner of Bethel Road and Sawmill Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan De Development District. The applicant is Gray Gables Realty, uh, care of attorney Jeffrey L. Brown, proposed use as an auto repair shop. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Northwest Civic Association's recommendation Recommendation is approval eight to zero. I first move to waive second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waive. Thank you. And now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0202-2019 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.38H and 3332.38G, private garage of the Columbus City Code to the property located at 1272 Cole Street to permit habitable space on the second floor of a detached garage with increased height in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Ebony Island. The proposed use is a habitable space above a garage. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Near East Area Commission's recommendation is approval 1201. Um, I'm gonna ask for a the um, so it's approval, but we do have one speaker, and it's um, the, the commission president, Kathleen Bailey. Please come to the podium. Please. You have three minutes. State your name and who you represent. Good evening, Kathleen Bailey, Chair, Near East Area Commission. I live at 489 Linwood for the last 30 years in the south of Maine. I'm just here really tonight for insurance. I have been blindsided before, and I know we had a pretty good response to this project, but I wanted to make sure nothing went wrong. So that's the only reason I'm here. I am now here nothing's going wrong, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Bailey, for coming okay. down. Um, so I move to waive a second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. And now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0203-2019 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.38H, private garage 3312.13, driveway 3312.25 maneuvering and 3332.38G, private garage of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 111, I mean 113, I'm sorry, Thurman Avenue, to permit habitable space on the second floor of a detached garage with um, reduced development standards in the R2F residential district. The applicant is Julie Bullock, Juliet Bullock. The proposed use is habitable space above a garage. The city department's recommendation is approval. The German Village Commission's recommendation is approval seven to zero. So first, I move to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. Thank you. I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Amend it. Thank you. And lastly, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0 to. 2019 to grant a variance for the provisions of sections 3332.035 R3 residential district 3312.49 minimum, minimum numbers of parking spaces required 3332.05 area district lot with requirements 3332.18 D basis of computing area 3332 32.19 fronting 3332.25 maximum side yard required, 3332.26 minimum side yard permitted, and 3332.27 rear yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 985 Bryden Road 
to permit a two-unit dwelling and a carriage house dwelling on the same lot with reduced development standards in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Wright Property Group, LLC. The proposed use is a two-unit dwelling and a, and a carriage house. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 14 to 0. We do have one speaker on this. President of the Area Commission, Ms. Kathleen Bailey, please come to the podium. She is saying she is for this. Yes, I'll be very uh, uh, briefly before you. Um, I, I just wanted to speak on, on behalf of this project. As you know, we had, it has overwhelming uh, support. But one of the things I wanted to bring up was I went to the part of the, the uh, conference that the mayor had last year, I think it was um, urban land development, and um, I remember going to the, uh, the when they did the final uh, review of the conference, and they were talking about the, the new term is called densification, that is now a, a new word, and it's, it's talking about uh, the need to increase density in the, in the inner city, um, for one thing, to help promote commercial development. Um, and one of the things that they came up with, the recommendation to achieve densification, was the use of carriage houses as residents. So I just want to thank uh, this developer, obviously, was listening. And I, the reason I'm bringing it up, because we still have some old timers in the neighborhood that they're worried about density and they don't want people living in carriage houses. So I just want to let you know, for the 21st century, that's no longer true. So I just want to thank you very much, and I thank the developer for coming up with a very beautiful project. But again, carriage houses are on the way up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey, for coming down and, and sharing um, your thoughts with our council this evening. And so with that, I would move to amend to emergency. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Amend it. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 3301-2018 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.039 R4 residential district, 3312.49 minimum numbers of parking spaces required, 3312.21 A3, B3, and D B2 landscaping and screening, and 3332.21 D2, building lines of the Columbus City Codes were probably located at 2959 Cleveland Avenue to permit a 45-unit apartment building with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. The applicant, excuse me, is Homeport, care of Dave Perry. The proposed use is an apartment building. The C Department's recommendation is approval. The North London Area Commission's recommendation is disapproval. I'll first ask for a staff presentation. Hey. Good evening, Council Members. The site is zoned in the R4 <laughs> Residential District and is comprised of undeveloped parcels and several vacant residential buildings. The requested Council variance will permit the development of a 45-unit apartment building a variance is necessary because the R4 residential district allows a maximum of four units in one, in one building. In addition to the use variance, requested variances include modified parking lot landscaping and reductions to required setbacks and parking. The site is within the boundaries of the North London Neighborhood Plan Amendment, which recommends neighborhood mixed use at this location. The request is consistent with the existing development pattern in this neighborhood and is compatible with the plan guidelines. It should be noted that the zoning staff does not support the proposal as a council variance application. Staff believes that multi-unit residential development of this density should be rezoned to an appropriate apartment residential zoning district and afforded the full review process applicable to rezoning applications, including a public hearing and review by the Development Commission. For that reason, this ordinance is conditioned on a follow-up rezoning to an appropriate zoning designation, designation within one year of its effective date, uh, but city departments do recommend approval.
I'm going to, so we're at, for terms of the staff presentation, do we want to have Director Shawnee, since you're part of the staff, speak at this point, or do you, would, would you prefer that we let the uh, applicant come up? Uh, Chair, the applicant. Ta Chair Tyson, members of council, I'm happy to speak whenever you would like me to speak. All right, that would be great. All right, then we will have, maybe we'll have the applicant come up and do the presentation, and then after that. So, the applicant is Dave Perry. Come towards the podium, please. <coughs> State your name and who you represent. Uh, good evening, President Harden, Zoning Chair Tyson, and all members of council. My name is Dave Perry. I'm a zoning consultant on this application to Homeport. Um, Homeport. Um, you all know Homeport, and Homeport has done great things in this city. This is um, another fine affordable housing project. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, with your permission, Council Member Tyson, I'm going to depart a little bit um, and just let Council know that um, Leah Evans, project manager and VP of uh, real estate development for Homeport is here and other members of Homeport. But uh, I know there are several speakers, and I, I don't need to repeat uh, the same thing about the project. And I, I think you're all familiar with what the project is. So uh, with your permission, I'd, I'd like to come back to the podium, perhaps after you hear the speakers. Normally, I mean, I think you do know. Do, we do, do, do you want me to go I, ahead I think with we it? do know the project, but I, I would first just suggest that you make the presentation or whether Leah make the presentation, but you have to make a presentation okay. in front of us and I, then you can come back and answer any questions. Okay, very good. The, um, the, the project is uh, proposed as a 45 unit apartment building on Cleveland Avenue, uh, south of Eddystone. It's an assemblage of parcels, uh, all zoned R4. The application before you is um, to permit the 45 unit apartment building uh, with the stated variances. Um, with your approval of the variance, if you, if you do so, the application, an application will be made to the Ohio Housing Finance Agency for 2019 project funding. Um, an OFA requirement is that uh, zoning must be in place at the time of application. So if, if there is not a variance, there will be no application to OFA versus um, if there is a variance for this project, then it, then it goes through the review process with OFA for funding. So, we have a 45 unit, um, 45 unit uh, dwelling unit proposal for the property. Um, it is, um, it includes uh, a variance to the R4 district. It includes a, a parking reduction and includes a couple other minor things related to landscaping and screening. You know, as part of this process, I've, um, I've reviewed a lot of documents, one of them being the one Linden plan. And that's a very exciting plan because it, it speaks to higher density on Cleveland Avenue. It speaks to Cleveland Avenue being the spine of, of one Linden. And um, it speaks to traffic calming on Linden and it speaks to higher density uh, on Cleveland Avenue and it speaks to the need for affordable housing. This, this project addresses all of those requirements, all of those recommendations. You've seen, uh, you've seen zoning requests for many urban development projects in the last 10 years. And in fact, uh, development has changed remarkably in the last 10 years to a, an urban development focus rather than Greenfield. Um, think, of, uh, uh, think of projects on um, East Livingston Avenue, Parsons Avenue, Cleveland Avenue in the Milo Grogan area. This project, has, this project and location has very similar characteristics to many projects that this council has heard. And what what, what happens with, with density on urban projects is that the density is what drives the use of public transportation and the use of local commercial services. Um, that's the, the, the heart of this is, is um, more population on arterial rights of way, future, future use of, greater use of public transportation and greater use of local commercial services. Um, I've worked for many of the providers of affordable housing on, on the parking issue. I've worked for many, many of the providers, and I can tell you they know their business. They, they know what parking they will need. So th this parking variance, supported by the city traffic staff, is uh, well within the range of 
parking that has been approved for urban development projects. So while there is a parking reduction, um, it's, it, it needs to be taken in the context of alternative modes of transportation and the location of the project. Um, I, I, believe, I believe the primary issues on this project have been uh, parking and density. So, so we have, um, we, we have the city support for a parking variance and additionally, due to the concern about parking, Homeport has negotiated the use of 13 parking spaces at the um, New Salem Baptist Church directly across the street. They don't believe operationally that they'll be needed, but um, they have provided additional parking to be available. On density, you know, density is an interesting thing, members of council, because density is just math. And by that, I mean, it's just, it's just the, the number of units divided by how big the site is. It's, it's just a, a product of that division. It doesn't speak to um, the quality of the project. It doesn't speak to um, the number of bedrooms. It doesn't speak to the number of people at the property. It's just math. And, you know, there's been, there's been some discussion of, uh, well, this, pro this project should have less units. And uh, again, Homeport knows their business and, and wants this mix of units of two bedroom and one bedroom units, but um, it, there could be less density simply by having more more two bedroom units and less one bedroom unit, or um, uh, um, more two bedroom units than, than one bedroom units, throwing in some three bedroom units. And so for the purposes of, of a planning exercise, we have a lower number density, but we, we don't have a very good product and we don't have a product that meets the needs of Homeport and, and the affordable housing initiative. So um, I, I raise density because it's often used as a, as a metric on projects, but it, it's really nothing more than math. And, and you have to, uh, I think you have to dig a little deeper in terms of the project. Um, the, um, the North London area plan speaks to um, neighborhood mixed use in the area and higher density multifamily being located on Cleveland Avenue, Westerville Road and other streets. This is all of that. So um, I'm, I'm happy to address any questions uh, after you hear the speakers. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Perry. I think, um, I think President Pro Tem Cinziano has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. You mentioned the 13 parking spots. Was that uh, shared before the commission's vote or was that something that occurred after the commission's vote? Uh, Council Member Stinziano, that occurred after the commission vote. There, there have been, uh, Parking has been a point of discussion, so after the commission vote, Homeport secured additional parking. And we do have a letter that states that. Yes. All right, so now we will hear um, any other questions for Mr. Perry? No. Thank you. So we will have, um, we have three, we actually have four speakers that are in support of this uh, legislation. However, we only hear three who are for it. So the first person that we'll hear from is Carol Perkins. After Carol Perkins will be Landon Adams, and then after Mr. Adams will be John Boxel. I'll just say the fourth one was Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins, but we only hear three. Thank you. Ms. Perkins, the floor yes. is yours. State I your name, you. Who, you, who you represent. My name is Carol Perkins. I live at 1580 Melrose Avenue, and I am a Linden, North Linden resident. To City Council President Hardin, President Pro Tem Stenziano, and City Council members, good evening. In the past, I've had the opportunity to speak to you about education, but this evening, I'm here to talk about support for the home port variance application. I am a member of New Salem Baptist Missionary Church. I serve as vice chair of the church's Community of Caring Development Foundation, but I am also a North London resident. My husband and I have lived in North London for over 30 years. This has always been a community of caring. It was a great place for us to raise our two children. I consider it a blessing to be able to live and worship in the area that I live. And we've never considered living anywhere else. We've seen our community at its best, but improvements, especially in housing, are needed 
through these revitalization initiatives. We've heard and seen about the mayor and the city leadership's vision of enhancements to the Cleveland Avenue via the One Linden Plan. This project will enable that vision to be realized. Approval of the variances presented to you this evening will help begin the process of hit, hitting the reset button for my community as it pertains to the creation and the development of new affordable housing in this area. I will close with this story. Yesterday, I was catching up on my newspaper reading and I came across an article in the New York Times. And the article was entitled, 52 Places You Should Go To in 2019. As I peruse this article, I notice that these weren't local places, but places listed from all over the world. Columbus, Ohio was on that list. Of the 52 places listed, Columbus was one of only eight cities in the United States that made that list. Columbus is considered a smart city due to our transportation initiatives, the creation of green spaces, technological advances, just to name a few. But the subtitle of this article that I'm referencing was that Columbus was considered the city of the future. In order to remain in this high esteem, Columbus must not only be a, a great place to visit, but also a great place to live. I thank you for allowing me this time and this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Mr. Landon Adams. Chair Tyson, uh, for the President, uh, Council Members, uh, newest member, uh, Councilwoman Favor, it's good to see your name and face in the Council. Congratulations. Again, my name is Landon Adams. Uh, I'm here as I do in my house with my wife, speaking for myself. <laughs> um, my grandfather was the first uh, one in our family to live in Linden, uh, having relocated from uh, Griffin, Georgia in the Great Migration. My father purchased a home and then rebuilt that home after a house fire when I was in high school. And when he died in 2008, I decided it was time to come home and to spend my life and work uh, in mission here in my hometown. And now my wife and I raise a fourth generation of Linden residents. Um, I have been privileged to sit on the One Linden Advisory Plan Committee. Um, and this last summer, I also had the opportunity to work on the Linden Farmers Market. Um, I have seen in my time and my work as a resident, as one who worships, who works, uh, who plays, who eats, uh, and lives in Linden, that we are on the edge of good work uh, that we have talked about for a long time. I support this variance as a way for us to continue advancing the work and the project, uh, to consider how we can bring more development um, and greater growth to Linden. We know development begets development. Uh, we like to think our work on the Linden Farmers Market is a part of that growth. Uh, we were able to create a place for new life and new community to exist and we think this new opportunity for new housing, uh, for local residents, for existing residents, and even new residents to come into the community is one that we should continue to explore. Uh, one of the things that we talked about at the One Linden Plan was worrying about gentrification. And we know that one of the ways that that, that happens is when you have a plan like this and local people don't take ownership of it and people from the outside swoop in and take advantage of opportunities that we have kind of laid the foundation for. So I'm excited about what this looks like of people in Columbus, companies and partners who are in Columbus, taking ownership of the plan and success forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Any questions for him? Seeing none, Mr. Boxall. Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Boxall and I serve as the Chief Operating Officer for New Salem Baptist Church located at 2956 Cleveland Avenue. Uh, tonight I'm here to voice our support for the proposed council variance uh, regarding the Homeport project. 
as is sometimes our custom, I would ask our members who are here, please stand uh, tonight because this is on behalf of the membership of the church. I would also like to submit for written record signatures from a petition signed by 65 of our members residing in the Linden community expressing their support for the project and the variances requested under consideration tonight. Additionally, we are including the listing of 104 New Salem members who reside in zip code 43224. New Salem moved to the current location in 1988, formerly housed the Baptist Temple, which occupied it from the 1950s through 1988. As the largest of the three property owners of the parcels that make up the proposed development site, we are excited about this potential development opportunity brings to the Linden community. Over the years, New Salem has done extensive work in the community, including operation of the Weep House Child Care Center, which uh, provided uh, Title IX, I'm sorry, uh, Title 20, I believe, uh, care for children in the community. We've done work with the East Linden Elementary School, uh, where we provided over 186,976 meals for students in 2018, bicycle giveaways for the last two years for fifth graders. Um, we've also been doing and dealing with food insecurity in the area, including 117,606 meals through our food pantry, 150 to 200 free meals each week uh, through our community dinner. In addition, we have also provided a number of outreaches in our community, including over the years more than $40,000 in grants to 17 local nonprofits through the Nehemiah Community Building Grants Program. And of course, Council Member Tyson remembers the work that we did with the farmer's market uh, that uh, Landon spoke to earlier. One of the things that I wanted to do was to talk about the other impacts that we've had related to crime in our community specifically looking at the anti-human trafficking initiative that uh, our own First Lady uh, Brenda Troy has been working with. In addition to tonight, we have a legal clinic going on uh, at the church during the time. Our members are passionate about being fully engaged in a community that we call home. We are a people who live, work, and worship in the Linden and consider the project to align with the One Linden Plan and the work done by the City of Columbus over the years. Several years ago, at the request of our pastor, the church made a concerted effort to make sure we engage the members of our community so that the church wasn't just in the community, but was a part of the community. At the time, the church had very few walk-up members, those who we defined as being living in the Linden area. Over the years, we have a number of members who are now living in 43224, 43211, 43219, and 43202. We believe that it is imperative to create opportunities to promote Linden as a place where people want to live, and one of the ways to do that is to build new housing options that would attract a broad range of potential residents. Thank you for your time and consideration. We look forward to working with Homeport and other neighbors to promote Linden as a place where families can live and thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boxel. <laughs> Mr. Boxel, <laughs> President Pro Tem Stenziano has either a question or a okay. statement. A uh, quick question, thank you, Madam Chair. Was New Salem support shared with the Area Commission before their vote? Yes. Thank you. There aren't any speaker slips for against this project. Um, I know that um, we have representatives from the Area Commission that are here. President John Lathram is in council chambers and some other commission, a couple other thing commissioners are in the room. And Mr. Lathram said he did not need to speak tonight, but I, cause I asked him, did he, cause normally the Air Commission can't speak. And he said he did not need to speak this evening. Um, I don't know if my council colleagues, before I call on um, Director Shoney, I don't know if there's a need for um, Mr. Perry to come back to the podium or not. Do you, I think that I'll let Director um, Shoney speak next. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Tyson, President Harden, members of the council. Um, uh, if Kathleen Bailey is still in the house, I might call her back up to give the introduction to my, to my um, comments because I think she hit on it um, earlier when she talked about the importance of density. And, and um, it's not just on the Near East Side, it's throughout the city and looking at our transit corridors. I did want to touch on a couple things because it's not – um, it, it's unusual for us to come and be advocating um, strongly for a project where uh, we did not have a positive res result at an area commission. And it's important, I think, for, for me as the development director, um, in particular on this project, where we have responsibility for housing to talk about the process we've gone, we went through before the vote and, frankly, the process we've gone through after the vote. 
So um, Homeport had been talking about this project internally and with New Salem um, for a while before uh, they formally came to the Area Commission with the project. They came to the Area Commission with the project in the fall and September. Um, did a series of meetings with the Area Commission uh, to explain the project, uh, ultimately resulting in a vote that was taken um, in, I believe it was October, November. Thank you, Council Member. Um, that um, since subsequent to that vote, as Council Member Stenziano um, alluded to, we've been continuing to have discussions. Homeport has been continuing to have discussions with uh, the Commission. Um, that resulted in some additional parking uh, spots being made available through their partnership with the church. And it also resulted in uh, this past Saturday, us, uh, along with Council Member Tyson, uh, the Department of Neighborhoods, Department of Public Service, having a conversation. Uh, with the Area Commission and the community to talk about um, how we see this project be, as being important to the future of the neighborhood. I think that meeting resulted in a much better understanding, frankly, on our part about the concerns that the Area Commission has, and I think a better understanding on the part of the neighborhood uh, members who were there and engaged in terms of why we see this project as being important. I think a couple of things um, that resonated from the conversation with the neighborhood was number one, one of the things we've learned in the process of looking at how our city is going to grow, and our city is going to grow, um, is that when we have the opportunity to start with mixed income and affordable projects in a neighborhood that we think is going to see new investment, we have to start there. Um, because if we don't start there early, we will lose the opportunity or it will become much harder to bring that affordability back into a neighborhood. That's one of the reasons we think this is a great place to start um, with new investment in Linden. Um, it's starting with a great partner in Homeport, a partner that has shown the ability um, to work with neighborhoods. The most, um, the closest and most pertinent examples, I think, the work they're doing in Milo Grogan. I think if you talk to um, members of the Milo Grogan Area Commission, you'll find they've had great experience with Homeport. Um, also, it's a very important project in terms of setting the tone for the redevelopment of Cleveland Avenue. We have to have more people um, living along Cleveland Avenue um, in high quality, relatively speaking, dense developments. This is a three-story development along a commercial corridor. This is, I think, consistent with the kinds of development we'll be seeing around the city on these kinds of uh, corridors. So my hope is that um, this is not the last time we'll be bringing a project like this to you. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll have done a better job of bringing um, this to the community and bringing the explanations that we've had over the last couple of months since the, the uh, commission vote um, so that we're not in uh, a similar situation with having a mismatch between the commission's vote and our recommendation. Thank you, Director Shoney. And um, I want to first of all thank the, um, the area commission and um, on Saturday, we had a meeting, as Director Shoney just alluded to, and the uh, meeting was well attended by the commissioners as well as um, community members. And one of the first, after the presentations with um, Carla Williams, Director Carla Williams Scott presented, Director Shoney, um, uh, Nick Bankston, there was representatives from public, from public service were there. But once all the presentations were made, um, um, the very first question was asked, generally when the Area Commission votes no on, or yes, either way, but votes no on um, a zoning issue, a variance or zoning, that we as a council tip, would vote that same way. And probably about 94% of the time, that does happen. But there are also, as I explained, there are also exceptions that there are times where the staff votes in disapproval and we still vote yes. And because we believe that we want to see that development in the community. And so in this situation, it was very important for a number of us to listen to what the, the, the North London Air Commission was saying to us on Saturday. And 
I think from that conversation, as Director Shoney just stated, that we have to have better commun communicate more. Even though we think that we are people are we're doing a good job, we we realized there had to be more, and it was a great meeting. After that meeting, I will tell you that many of a number of people came up to me and said thank you, and they were in support of this. Of course, you can't go back and change the vote, but they. It was a very different meeting. And so um, we understand, as Director Schoen just stated, the importance of change in our communities, the number of people that are going to be living in our communities. Um, we want to make sure we have workforce housing. People who go to work every single day need to be able to have a, you know, wonderful places to live. And we can only do that when you have public-private partnerships. That's how that works. And, and so for me, um, with all due respect to um, our North London Area Commission, and I'm so glad they're in, they're in council chambers tonight. And it does say something that they didn't come up and speak in, in disapprove to say, to continue to say we don't approve of this. That really does speak volumes. And I appreciate their willingness to listen and to be able to communicate with us in this. So I've had a chance to talk to all of my colleagues after the meeting on Saturday. And um, for, as a zoning chair, I would be voting to recommend that we move this project forward for the, for our, this is so important for our community. Just like we had to, and I said this, for those of you who have born and raised in Columbus, think about City Center Mall. And I can go back before City Center Mall when it was Lazarus and the Union. So, but, but again, when it was City Center Mall, and then because of various reasons that mall was closed, it was just an albatross downtown. And nobody knew what to do with that building. But the plan was to tear that building down, make a park, and we said we'd also build development around it. And now I don't think anyone would, would say that that was the wrong decision because now we have the park and we have apartments and condos here. If you look at what's going on, on the Near East Side, look at all the changes that are happening there. Look at Oak Street when, when we had. So there's this change is coming, and it's so important. And when we hear neighborhoods tell us, well, we want the same neighborhood as another neighborhood, this is how you do it. This is what we do. Think about the short north, what that was in the past. Look at it today. So it's changed, and it's a great partner, and so I am in support of the legislation. And I don't know if my colleagues want to. Council Member Mitchell Brown has some comments. Well, I think it's important to acknowledge your leadership here, uh, Sir Tyson. Um, this issue could have been brought up a lot sooner, and who knew what the vote would have been at that particular time. But your diligence, your engagement, this past weekend, you and Shoney being there to listen and to hear Director Shoney say, hey, we had to do a better job the way in which we communicate when we have issues like this. So I want to make sure that everyone appreciates the fact that you were the real catalyst in making this all happen and making sure that there was time to spend so that everybody could understand exactly what this project was and whether or not it should or should not go forward. So from me personally, thank you. You got to recommend uh, Director Colorado Scott was there and her team, so she was there too. So, uh, again, I thank you for that. And Council, Mem Council President Harden. Thank you, Chair Tyson. I also want to echo Councilmember Brown's appreciation for your leadership um, on this uh, ordinance and the work um, and, and the, the advocacy that, that went in uh, to this and the work that was done over this past week and even. I think that, that they brought some real clarity there. Um, just a quick question for Director. Um, a vote yes for this as we move forward would um, uh, what's the likelihood that we will then receive the OVA tax credit? Ooh, um, thank you, Council President Harden, for the question. Um, I think thank you. Uh, you know, I, it's um, switching gears real quick. Um, it, it's hard to predict, honestly. Yeah. It's something we're going to continue to push for. These are competitive tax credits. There's no guarantee we're going to get the project. Um, however, I can guarantee you without this vote, we won't get the project. Right. Um, so we're going to continue pushing. Um, it's going to be something. Do we still rank there. projects? No, we don't. We've gone to a different system now um, that uh, I'd 
be happy to brief you on in another. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I have a number of colleagues waiting out in the hallway that I would be have very unhappy with me if I went into that right now. So, well, I appreciate uh, the work that you guys put in, and and you speaking on behalf of this uh, goes a long ways. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, President Harden. And again, this is a variance. And if we get the low income tax credits, we'd be coming back to have conversations with the community so that they uh, are very much engaged in this overall project. So this is not the last conversation. This is just a step to move it, move it forward. And so with that, I would um, first move to waive second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, in favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, in favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Orange is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, all right, so the next ordinance is 0041-2019 to rezone 5850 Sunbury Road being 6.3 acres located on the east side of Sunbury Road, 1,000 feet south of State Route 161 from our, our rural district to LARLD Limited Apartment Residential District. The attorney is um, Jill Tangman, and um, I'm going to move to take this from the table. Brown, Brown, in favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Move from table. And thank you. I would move the table until February the 11th of 2019. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, in favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Table. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0042-2019 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 5850 Sunbury Road to permit an apartment complex with reduced perimeter yard in the LARLD limited apartment dist residential district. The applicant is Metro Development LLC, Attorney Jill T Care of Attorney Jill Tangman. Um, I first move to take this from the table. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Now I move to table it to February the 11th of 2019. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Table. Is that, is that all that we have in? That's all I have on Zoning this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I can't get a motion to adjourn uh, meeting number four of the Zoning Committee. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Meeting adjourned. We will uh, commence special meeting number three momentarily. I'm ready. <laughs> Got a pot. Thank you. We are, we have reconvened um, meeting number three. We are in the Finance Committee. Committee uh, Chair, Chairwoman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council President. Um, we were about to read the five resolutions establishing necessity of placing the city's voted bond package proposal on the ballot for the May 7th election. I'm going to uh, read and move for passage. The final one does have a speaker, so if Ms. Bobby Garber would like to make her way up at a leisurely pace while I read these. Resolution 0015X-2019 to declare the necessity of bond issue and to submit the question of such issue to the electors in the amount of $205 million for health, safety, and infrastructure. Uh, I move for adoption. Second. I first wa request a waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. And now I move for adoption. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Resolution 0016X-2019 to declare the necessity of bond issue and to submit the question of such issue to the electors in the amount of $100 million for recreation and parks. I first request to waive second reading. Okay. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Resolution 0017X-2019 to declare the necessity of bond issue and to submit the question of such issue to the electors in the amount of $425 million for public service. I request to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. 
Resolution 0018X-2019 to declare the necessity of bond issue and to submit the question of such issue to the electors in the amount of $250 million for water, power, sanitary sewers, and storm sewers. I request to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waive. I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Resolution 0019X-2019 to declare the necessity of bond issue and to submit the question of such issue to the electors in the amount of $50 million for neighborhood development. Uh, Ms. Bobby Garber is here to speak in favor of the resolution. You may come to the podium. Please identify who you're here with, if anyone, and uh, you have three minutes. I'm Bobby Garber. I'm executive <clears throat> director of the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. Um, in, uh, Chair Brown, President Hardin, uh, members of council, and welcome new council member and chair of the housing committee, uh, Councilwoman Favors. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about is the unprecedented step that's being taken to put money in the bond issue for affordable housing. As you know, the Alliance has identified a 54,000 household affordable housing gap in Franklin County. These are households at or near poverty, mostly renters, but also owners who pay more than half of their income for housing. And just to remind you, poverty level in 2018 for a family of four was about $25,000 a year. We spend a lot of time in the Alliance reminding people who these 54,000 households are. <clears throat> the Alliance has developed a plan to cut the gap in half uh, using three strategies. And amazingly, because I got to hear all this tonight, you heard about all of them. You heard about development, um, and we uh, proposed construction and preservation of affordable and mixed income housing. We, a strategy, another strategy is home repair and modification for low-income seniors and people with disabilities and housing stabilization, which is rent assistance linked with services for persons with, in targeted populations. And you heard from the Human Services Chamber tonight. Those are organizations that provide these programs. From the beginning, we've worked with community leaders to identify a champion or champions to make the first public pledge of significant resources to be in closing the gap. And we are so pleased that Mayor Ginther and the Columbus City Council are those champions beginning with the $5 million in the 2018 capital improvements budget, <clears throat> and now with $50 million for affordable housing. And though it's called neighborhood development, we're taking Mayor Ginther at his word. <laughs> this <laughs> is intended for affordable housing. And so we want to uh, commend this historic step. Um, the city is in a very unique position now as a champion to leverage private sector investment and funds from other local governments. We know that this is not just a Columbus problem. Um, and we know that the mayor is asking key players to come to the table to develop a regional housing plan in 2019. The Alliance will be pleased to be part of that effort and assist the city in jump-starting the planning process using the work that we and others have uh, recently done on housing commissions, housing needs, trends, and models. We agree that study and planning is certainly important to, before making decisions. But in the current housing environment, where we already are behind and need is growing, time is not our friend. We need to move forward with investing in the proven solutions described in the Alliance Plan as soon as possible. We, use, we urge Columbus to use the funding power that will come with the bond issue, if it is passed, in a way that produces the most affordable housing solutions possible. Truly affordable housing, not just relatively affordable housing. So once again, we want to thank you for taking this important step. You are truly Alliance champions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Garber. I appreciate uh, your time and advocacy. Thank you. Uh, this is a truly important uh, issue that we are considering, and uh, it is merely a first step. Um, we cannot waste this opportunity, um, and we've also got to um, it's got it's got it's got to go through the process of going to the ballot <laughs> and right. then actually um, expending the dollars. So, right. thank you again. Thank you. Um, I request to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor. Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. And I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor. Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. 
Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 001-2019 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to enter into three universal term contracts for the option to purchase sanitary paper supplies with Carmen's Distribution System Incorporated, Hilliard Incorporated, and Key 4 Cleaning Supplies Incorporated, and to, uh, to authorize the expenditure of $3 from the General Budget Reservation BRPO000978. I'd just like to highlight that these universal term contracts will cover the purchase of menstrual products to go along with toilet paper, paper towels, and other paper products. I look forward to the ongoing work with Director Collins and his staff as we work to make menstrual products more accessible for um, Columbus women and menstruators. There is simply no reason that menstrual products should be treated differently from toilet paper uh, when both deal with bodily functions that um, people can't avoid. Uh, when we treat them differently, we invite shame onto menstruators for a bodily function. And um, I am looking forward to continuing the work that we're doing with the Recreation and Parks Department to make sure that we are freely um, and freely accessibly providing menstrual products in as many bathrooms as we possibly can in the city of Columbus and beyond. Um, so I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. May I move to the Recreation and Parks Committee? Please. We have Ordinance 0124-2019 to authorize the Director of the Recreation and Parks Department to apply for grant funding from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Clean Ohio Trails Fund, which will be used to build the Eastmore Green Line and to declare an emergency. The Eastmore Green Line will be a unique 17 and a half acre linear park and trail running from Broad Street to south of Livingston Avenue along three miles of an abandoned rail corridor. The project will increase access to greenways for more than 10,000 residents and eight schools located within the immediate area. ODNR administers statewide grant funding for the construction of trails and this is required for the grant submission to the state. If awarded funding, a separate piece of legislation will be submitted at a later date to enter into the agreement and allocate the local funds. Seeing no questions, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. I have one ordinance dealing with recreation and parks in rules and reference. May I read that now? Please. Uh, it is on page 24, Ordinance 3425-2018 to amend Section 919.06 of the Columbus City Code to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to promulgate policies and rules for issuing permits for use of parks or facilities and to declare an emergency. Um, in 1991, Columbus established in City Code that more than 10 people gathering in a park required a permit. This amendment eliminates the number 10 from city code and gives the Director of Recreation and Parks more flexibility to set rules for issuing permits. We expect that this will create a better experience for residents who want to gather in our parks. And the goal is to improve that experience right away, which is why emergency action is being considered so these updates can be made before the 2019 application is released. I'd like to thank the director. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleague, uh, Councilmember Stinziano, Pro President Pro Tem Stinziano, who's co-sponsor on this, but who really advocated on behalf of the residents who reached out to him um, regarding this hurdle uh, that, that was caused with sort of an outdated policy. So thank you for your co-sponsorship. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, any questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. President Harden, that's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is the Public Safety Committee. That committee is chaired by uh, Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight I have Ordinance 0210 2019 to authorize an appropriation of $1,142,881.16 from the unappropriated balance of the Law Enforcement Contraband Seizure Fund to the Division of Police to fund travel and training needs, software maintenance, computer services, refund monies for court order claims against the Division of Police and other police supplies and services needed, and to declare an emergency. If there are no comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stin Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Also, we have Ordinance 0239-2019 to accept the proposed collective bargaining agreement in its entirety between the City of Columbus and the Fraternal Order of Police, Capital City Lodge No. 9, dated December 9, 2017, through December 8, 2020. 
to provide for wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment for employees in the bargaining units as provided in the attached hereto and to declare an emergency. The City of Columbus and the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge No. 9 began negotiating this contract in September 2017. The city was represented by our Human Resources Department, Finance Department, and Department of Public Safety leadership. The bargaining teams met on 22 occasions in an effort to negotiate a success or collective bargaining agreement. However, in April 2018, the parties reached a point of impasse. At that time, a fact finder was assigned to the dispute by Ohio State Emergency Relations Board. From August to October 2018, the parties presented witnesses and exhibits in support of their respective positions. On November 27, 2018, the fact finder issued his report and recommendations. Neither party rejected the fact finder's report or recommendations, therefore the award has been deemed accepted. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Director Brandon and the city's bargaining team for their diligence and hard work in negotiating this contract, and also would like to thank Attorney Ron Linville. If there are no further questions, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. That's all we have in public safety, sir. Thank you, Chair. Next committee coming for council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. That committee is chaired by uh, Councilman Remy. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Tonight I have an ordinance number 0045-2019 to authorize the Chief Innovation Officer to execute a first modified not-for-profit service contract with the Columbus Partnership relative to the implementation of the Smart Columbus Electrification Plan to authorize the expenditure of $1,365,000 from the Smart City Private Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0050-2019 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize a transfer of funds within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Strasser Paving, Paving Company in connection with 88 ramp projects citywide curb ramps 2018 project to authorize the expenditure of up to 500000 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for the ADA Ramps Project, Citywide Curb Ramps 2018 Project, and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Strasser Paving for the ADA Pro Ramp Project, Citywide Curb Ramps 2018 Project, and to provide payment for construction, construction administration, and inspection services. This contract includes building ADA curb ramps at various locations in Columbus based on the 311 service request ramp priority list. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0071-2019 to amend the 2018 capital improvements budget to appropriate funds within the Polaris TIF Fund, the Polaris Interchange Fund, the Federal Transportation Grants Fund, and the Transportation Grants Fund to transfer cash and appropriation between the Polaris TIF Fund and the Polaris Interchange Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Complete General Construction Company for the Arterial Street Rehabilitation Polaris Parkway PID 95549 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $12,767,366.81 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund, the Polaris Interchange Fund, the Federal Transportation Grants Fund, and the Transportation Grants Fund for the Arterial Street Rehabilitation Polaris Parkway PID 95549 project and to declare an emergency. This project widens 0.57 miles of Polaris Parkway from Interstate 71 to Old Worthington Road to provide a third through lane in both directions and performs a full depth replacement of 0.39 miles of Worthington Road, Orion Place, including the construction of a two lane roundabout at the intersection with Old Worthington Road. Other improvements include traffic signal replacement, sidewalk, shared use paths, a retaining wall, landscaping, and street lighting. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 0141-2019 to authorize the Director of Public Service to prepare and submit safe routes to school and highway safety improvement program applications to the Ohio Department of Transportation to accept and expend grant funds if awarded, to issue refunds if necessary after final accounting is performed, and to declare an emergency. 
The Ohio Department of Transportation annually accepts applications to fund projects using Safe Routes to Schools program funds. Safe Routes to Schools funds are available to communities as grants to be used to improve the ability of elementary and middle school students to walk and bicycles to school safely. The total funding available statewide is $4 million, and a community may be awarded up to $400,000 for an infrastructure project. The Department of Public Service is preparing a Safe Routes to School application with a current focus on constructing three new sidewalks, Ann Street from Stewart Avenue to Whittier Street, Ann Street from Freebus Avenue to Midoff Street, and 17th Street from Marcuson Avenue to Freebus Avenue. This project would be in the Columbus Southside area. This project has already received design funding from City Council as part of the Public Services Operation Safe Walks. This project would benefit students walking to schools in the area, including Lincoln Park Elementary School. The Columbus City Schools district-wide travel plan identified the Ann Street and 17th Street corridors as priority corridors for Lincoln Park Elementary School. Walking is a significant mode at Lincoln Park Elementary, with 40% of students walking to school. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you very much. The next ordinance we have in public service this evening is 0189-2019. To amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Danver Inc. for the miscellaneous economic development creative campus phase two project to authorize the expenditure of up to $5,651,931.11 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and up to $55,874.17 from the Water General Obligation Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Danbert Inc. for the Miscellaneous Economic Development Creative Campus Phase II project and to provide payment for construction, construction administration, and in inspection services. This project consists of improvements of Cleveland Avenue, including roadway reconstruction with lane reconfiguration with curb adjustments, addition of curb extensions defining on-street permeable paver parking areas, wider sidewalks, new street trees and tree lawns, new street lighting, new mast arm traffic signals, relocation of all overhead utilities to underground systems, new st stormwater facilities and traffic control changes. The Spring, Spring Street and Washington Avenue intersection improvements will include widening and installing new mast arm traffic signals. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. <clears throat> That's all I have this evening in public service and transportation. With your permission, I'll move to administration. Please. Great. The next eight pieces of legislation, legislation pertain to pieces of legislation that um, affect the benefit packages for our city employees. There are over 8,500 um, employees within the city of Columbus, and these will pertain to their 2019 benefits package. Our first ordinance in administration is 0013-2019 to make appropriations for the 12 months ending January 31st, 2020 for the funding of the city employee insurance programs and to declare an emergency. I do have one speaker against this, um, this ordinance. It is Jonathan Michael Cross. Mr. Cross, if you'd like to come forward and speak on this subject, you will have three minutes to speak. Please. 0013-2019. Administration? The benefits package? Please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Members of Council, President Harden and distinguished guests, my name is Jonathan Michael Cross and I'm President and CEO of Manly & Bright Company, LLC. I reside at 1583 Coronet Drive, Columbus, Ohio, 43224. As a native of this city, former Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority resident, Linda McKinley High School and Capital University alum, youth advocate and social entrepreneur, I am keenly aware of the profound need to strike a rational balance between the often competing 
imperatives of meaningful public policy, effective human development, and sustainable economic growth. However, as a politically independent and spiritually liberated taxpaying citizen, the bulk of my work is bound up with the aspirations of other equally committed brothers and sisters from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences existing, insisting upon, upon change. Change does not mean only Democrats or only Republicans running everything. It doesn't mean abusing the public coffers to reward wealthy campaign donors, nor does it imply cherry-picking grant opportunities on behalf of not-so-creative family members and friends while flouting federal civil rights law as it pertains to requirements dealing with the awarding of local municipal contracts. To the contrary, it it comes to, uh, when it comes to improving outcomes, raising living standards, and rehabilitating a social contract presently in tatters, change has to do with a large-scale increase in both public education and civic engagement by people committed to reclaiming every single aspect of their democracy. Uh, this evening, we rise in conscientious objection to the highly problematic manner in which this council fills vacancies. We, we rise to call attention to the gross and preferential abuse of tax abatement and uh, grant allocation processes in this city. We rise to express our outrage at local government's collusion with a very insidious gentrification scheme designed to systematically displace tens of thousands of predominantly African American and working class residents, despite all of the photo ops and the uh, presentation by New Salem to the contrary, and we rise to pose uh, the question of what actually constitutes a quote unquote state of emer emergency, specifically in terms of how this council spends the people's money. Uh, most importantly, we rise to remind members of council that whether as elected or selected public servants, your job is to create a level playing field for private sector businesses to thrive in a free market, not to misuse your positions in the public sector to essentially take the place of the private sector. Last November, we introduced plans with Ohio Secretary of State John Houston to initiate a formal legal process of annexing the greater South Linden area from the city of Columbus. That's why you guys want to do the one Linden plan now. Uh, we are embarking upon this course because of your unwillingness to listen, because of your insistence upon undermining our businesses, because of your desire to close our grocery stores and our schools, and because of your determination to utterly gentrify our neighborhoods. Uh, when young black males were being murdered and sent to prison wholesale from my neighborhood where I lived and went to school, I wasn't bust in. I'm from the neighborhood. Uh, nobody was talking anything about one lending. However, now that rapacious developers and alienated trust funds, trust fund babies are all clamoring for access to uh, locally debased real estate in the inner city, you all expect us to trust you in having judgment that painful history and empirical experience which strenuously beg to contradict. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your valuable time and urgent attention in these very important regards, and thank you for the added few seconds at the end. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Cross. We appreciate you coming down. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0014-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with United Healthcare Insurance Company and to provide all eligible employees medical insurance coverage from February 1, 2019 through January 31, 2020 to authorize the expenditure of $154,200,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the costs of said contract to waive the competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Codes and to declare an emergency. Director Brandon, could you speak to the reasons why we're waiving competitive bidding on this and the future pieces of legislation? This piece is for the United Healthcare. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, President Hardin, Chairman Remy, and members of council. The legislation that's before you for United Healthcare is a contract modification to extend that contract for one year. The reason we requested this was because United Healthcare was very instrumental during the negotiation process of the six or well, five bargaining units and one ordinance that we worked on. And 2019 is the year that we are actually beginning to implement the changes for FOP and IAFF. And so during that process, uh, we thought that it would make sense to administer this program with the organization that worked with us on the major plan designs that we made. Uh, we are right now putting an RFP out on the street because in 2020 this very um, 
service will go out to bid. But for 2019, we requested to extend it and modify the contract by one year so that we could have uh, United Healthcare very much involved in the initial implementation of the changes that were negotiated. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 0016-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with OptumRx to provide all eligible employees prescription drug insurance coverage from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 to authorize the expenditure of $45,315,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract to waive the competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Codes and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance 0017-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with Delta Dental Plan of Ohio, Inc. to provide all eligible employees dental insurance coverage from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 to authorize the expenditure of $8,145,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have 0018-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with Vision Service Plan to provide all eligible employees Vision's plan administration from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 to authorize the expenditure of $1,076,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have 0019-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with Dearborn National to provide all eligible employees short-term disability insurance coverage from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 to authorize the expenditure of $3,350,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0020. 2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the contract with Dearborn National Life Insurance Company to provide all eligible employees life insurance coverage from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020, and to authorize the expenditure of $1,075,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And finally, this evening, I have 0025-2019 to authorize the Human Resources Director to modify and extend the existing contract with Aon Hewitt Consulting from February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 to waive competitive bidding provisions in Chapter 329 of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of $200,000 from the Employee Benefits Fund 5502 or so much thereof as may be necessary to pay the cost of said contract and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. And that's all I have this evening in administration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next committee to come before council is the Housing Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in the Housing Committee, we have ordinance number 0062-2019 to authorize the Director of Development to renew existing contracts approved in ordinances 0554-2018, 055-2018, and 0556-2018, including modifying the renewal contracts to add additional funds 
in order to provide services through the contract completion date if necessary to authorize the expenditure of up to $1 million in the land management fund for these renewals and to declare an emergency. Uh, development will renew 20 contracts for organizations and businesses, including Homes on the Hill, Friends of the Hilltop, Franklinton Rising, Motivation, Central Community House, and others. Amenities include providing lawn care and maintenance service, trash and debris removal from structures, cleaning of abated and vacant lots, graffiti removal, and on city-owned property held in the land bank. Are there any questions or concerns from my colleagues? If there are no questions, I move for passage of the ordinance. Second. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. President Hardin, that is all I have in the housing. May I please move on to Judiciary and Court Administration? Please. Thank you. Uh, tonight in Judiciary and Court Administration, we have Ordinance number 0224-2019 to authorize and direct the city attorney to settle the lawsuit known as Miranda L. Panda et al. v. Shana M. Keckley et al. pending in the United States District Court, Southern District of Ohio, to authorize the expenditure of the sum of $150,000 in settlement of these claims and to declare an emergency. I would now like to ask City Attorney Klein to give a little background on these claims. Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. The plaintiffs, Miranda Panda and Brittany Walters, were arrested on July 11, 2018, at Sirens Gentlemen's Club. They were both charged under Ohio Revised Code 2907.40C2, a violation of illegal sexual oriented activity in a sexually oriented business. An element of this offense is that the offender regularly appears and regularly means consistently or repeatedly. The charges against each plaintiff failed to allege that element of the crime. Further, plaintiffs were accused of knowingly touching a patron defined as anyone on the premise uh, of a sexually oriented business that explicitly excludes a public employee. The plaintiffs were alleged to have touched an on-duty police detective who was at Sirens in an undercover capacity carrying out duties as a detective, which is excluded from the definition of a patron. Based on the problems with these two arrests, my office took the position on July 11, 2018, that the charges should be dismissed, and they were dismissed on July 18, 2018. Plaintiffs have brought an unlawful arrest claim under 42 U.S.C. 1983, for which, if they would prevail, they would be entitled to damages resulting from the arrest, including emotional distress and state court attorney's fees, and any and all attorney's fees related to the litigation of the federal case. In addition, in light of a potential conflict between the position I took and my office took and the individual defendants, I also had to give consideration to hiring additional outside counsel to represent the individual defendants, in this case, the officers named in the complaint uh, from the division of the police. Based on the problems associated with the arrest and charges and the very real possibility that liability could be established in conjunction with the additional expenses associated with paying attorney's fees, it is likely that the eventual cost of this case will easily eclipse the settlement amount. I have consulted with and sought approval from the Department of Public Safety in this matter, and accordingly I ask council to vote in favor of this legislation. Thank you, City Attorney Klein. If there are no questions by my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank, thank you, that's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, the next committee to come before council is uh, Public Utilities. Public Utilities Chair by uh, President Pro Tem Cinziano. The floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in Public Utilities, bring forward an ordinance 3361-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a service agreement with the Ohio Basement Authority for the Volunteer Sump Pump Program, Blueprint Clintonville 1, Project 3, to authorize the transfer within of $1,075,222.62 in the expenditure of $1,482,126.62 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2018 Capital Improvements Budget. The work for this project 
consists of installing sump pumps and other such work as may be necessary to administer the volunteer sump pump program in relation to Project Blueprint. As we've brought forward before, uh, homes in the City of Columbus built before the 1960s uh, have foundation drains uh, that connect directly to the sanitary sewer. Uh, our goal of Project Blueprint is to redirect that and to uh, make sure that we no longer are filling up our sanitary sewer systems beyond capacity and overflows into our rivers. Uh, and that's what this program uh, provides for. Those interested in the sump pump program should visit www.blueprintneighborhoods.com slash sump pump for more information. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Next is Ordinance 3446-2018, authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a professional engineering service agreement with ACOM Technical Services for the inflow redirection Markinson project in the hydraulic modifications to CSO regulator Markinson project to authorize the transfer within of $513,822.87 and a total expenditure of up to $2,351,141.87 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2018 Capital Improvements Budget. The scope of work for these projects is to design approximately 9,900 linear feet of new storm sewer for the purposes of redirecting public sources of storm water inflow and from approximately 154 acres. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, Ordinance 12-2019, to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with the Ohio Basement Authority for the Roof Redirection Clintonville 1 Schreier Springs project and to expend up to $2,017,309.94 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund. The project is needed to mitigate water in basements and sanitary sewer overflows in the neighborhood. This particular portion of the project will consist of redirecting and replacing downspout drain tiles for up to 200 houses. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And the last ordinance is 118-2019 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of water treatment chemicals for the Division of Water to authorize expenditure of $14 million from the Water Operating Fund and declare an emergency. Uh, this ordinance will allow the Division of Water to continue to provide safe and reliable drinking water uh, to the citizens of Columbus and our surrounding communities. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Favor, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you, President Hardin. That's all we have in public utilities. Thank you, Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Health and Human Services Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Hardin. I have Ordinance 0136 says 2019 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept the grant service contract from the Franklin County Alcohol. Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board in the amount of $1,673,556.46 and to authorize the appropriation of $2,134,556.46, which includes program revenues to the Health Department and the Health Department Grants Fund to declare an emergency. The Alcohol Drug Services Prevention Program and Columbus Public Health will serve approximately 9,526 unique clients who may receive multiple services through Columbus City Schools, after school, summer programs, and recreation and parks. Of this number, approximately 4,371 adults and family members will be served. 5,155 children and adolescents will be served. The ADS Comprehensive Treatment Program will provide treatment services to approximately 1,050 men and women of that, 23% of the women are women and and 68% are men. The treatment program will be providing medic medication assisted treatment to approximately 105 clients. Additionally, we're expanding outreach services to serve approximately 500 clients. The alcohol drug, um, alcohol and drug services grant project is primarily funded through Franklin County Adam H. Board, but also generates the following revenues which are, which are to be appropriated. Clients fees in the amount of $26,000 and Medicaid in the amount of $435,000 for the total appropriation of $2,134,556.46. 
$134,556.46. These funds will enable Comas Public Health to continue to provide treatment, counseling, and prevention services to men, women, children, families, homeless population, and to serve clients referred to by the criminal justice system. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Is there a second? Please Brown, Brown, in favor. Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have in my committee this evening. Thank you, Chair uh, Tyson. Seeing no further business come before council, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, favor. Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Meeting is adjourned. We will take uh, non-agenda speakers uh, momentarily. Let's just go ahead and jump into it.